Thank you so much. We are starting the budget committee meeting today. We are dealing with the division of revenue bill for 2023 B2 from the NCOP uh, in the budget committee today. My name is Deirdre Bartman. I'm chair of the committee. I'm going to ask that the members online um, just introduce themselves as well as our NCOP delegate. I will then also ask that the provincial treasury delegation, Mr. Pakis Kobi and Mapumala, uh, also uh, uh, introduce themselves. In terms of the Division of Revenue Bill, it is a bill that we've received from the National Council of Provinces, from the National Parliament, um, and it is a Section 76 bill. Um, we will also have our provincial um, delegate here from the NCOP on the committee who will assist us with National Treasury on the briefing. This will be followed by the mm. public hearing. Um, I have not received any um, requests for me members of the public online, uh, but if there are any online or in the chamber by that time, we will allow those um, comments. This particular bill's adverts and calls for submission were also published in Afrikaans, English and Zinkosa in the Burger on the 15th of April 2023, on the August 16th of April 2023 and the Vukani 13 April 2023. I want to remind those who are online just to please mute their mics if you're online on the MS Team platform um, in order to avoid background noises. Um, if you want to flag a point of order, you can raise your hand on the platform or if you can't raise your hand on your particular device, you can always indicate in the chat box. And also if you're not on the floor um, presenting or asking a question or speaking, if you can just please um, put your video off as well. Thank you so much. Members online, if you can introduce yourselves. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Khalil Brankes and I'm a member of the this, uh, Budget Committee of the Western Cape Government. Thank you, Chair. Afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair, to you and members of staff that are in attendance and also fellow MPLs online. My name is Lula Mamzindi. Afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair. Afternoon, Mr. Njadu. Yes, good afternoon. Good. Uh, I'm a member of the National Council of Provinces um, on the NCOP. Thank you. Afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair. Kayla Murray, member um, of the Budget Committee and also standing committee chair for Finance, Economic Opportunities and Tourism. Afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair. It's Derek America, member of the committee, and good afternoon, colleagues. Afternoon. We're just trying to see if there are more members online that wish to introduce themselves. If none, then uh, National Treasury, if we can go over to you for introductions, please. Um, good, good afternoon, honorable members. Thanks for the opportunity. It's Let's Have a the director responsible for the local government fiscal framework. Afternoon. Thanks. Good afternoon, uh, honorable members. Uh, my name is Mandlengosi Hobiani from the National Treasury, uh, director responsible for Western Cape government. Thank you. Afternoon. Um, is it Ms. Mapumula that is online? We received notice that you'll also be attending. Are you unmuted? <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Thank Good you so much. Honorable members and everyone who's joining mm. in. This is Yolanda Mapumolo from National Treasury, responsible for monitoring of conditional grants. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, are there anyone else that is online? Good afternoon, honorable members. My name is Olorato Tlaile, and I also work at the National Treasury. Afternoon. Good afternoon, honorable members. My name is Matapel Mapangela, also from the National Treasury, responsible for the local government fiscal framework. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I see one or two extra people online, and I'm not sure if they're part of the delegation. Um, is it Mr. or Ms. Nyaka? 
afternoon, honorable members. Uh, my name is Pindogutle Mnyaka, uh, also from National Treasury in the local government fiscal framework team. Thanks. Afternoon. Okay. Colleagues, uh, we're going to hand. Yes, sorry, I heard Mr. Uh, member Brankais, yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Chair, um, member Nkondlo, uh, just uh, made contact with me now. She's trying to log on. Okay. Um, and um, I th she, she said also that she was logged on. And uh, I think just before the meeting started, then she got some technical uh, 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 technical situation there. So she is trying to log on. Okay, no problem. Um, the procedural officer is also attempting to call her into the meeting. Yeah, I see. With I that, we're going to continue you. as we do have quorum for the meeting. Um, I'm going to now hand over to first the provincial delegate, Mr. Njadu, and then National Treasury, just to take us through the bill. Um, and then we will open for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Am I audible? You are. Thank you. You may continue. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, um, all the provinces, um, the nine provinces are meeting now during this time and um, preparing the division of, of revenue mandates, uh, negotiating mandates from provinces. And then uh, as the Western Cape, um, we are also as National Treasury engaging on the division of revenue uh, bill for provinces to raise their matters from the provinces as we are representing provinces. And then Chairperson, uh, without any delay, um, I will request uh, National Treasury to take us through the presentation and then we will then take it uh, further from that point. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you. National Treasury. Uh, good, good afternoon again, honorable members. I will take the first part of the presentation and then thereafter I will invite my colleagues, Amanda uh, and Yolanda, to then take uh, the rest of the uh, presentation. Uh, from our side, uh, honorable members, uh, how the presentation is looking is that we've got an overview. Where we'll on the summer points today, the slides that are really focused on the provincial government allocations. And then Orlando will be dealing with the slides that are purely focused on the local government uh, allocation. And, and then, of course, we'll allow your attention uh, to the additional information which relates to uh, the responses that have been provided to the FFC uh, based on the recommendations that they had made. But also various uh, uh, committees have made recommendations which we have also responded to in terms of the details that are contained in Annex A of the budget review, which we are happy to share uh, with, the, with the honorable members. In terms of our division of revenue, honorable members, I think uh, this year was no different really. Um, we still face the, 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 the challenges where our growth is not at the level uh, where you know we wanted it to be. Um, as a result, uh, there was minimal space really to maneuver in terms of providing additional resources. As you can see now, uh, the national share only grows uh, at around just below 1%. And, and that is really owing to uh, some of the non-recurring uh, items that are provided for in the budget. Uh, uh, those would relate to the support that has been provided to the SOEs, but also um, the SRD or the, the, the extension of the SRD grant, uh, which is not provided for over the MTF. Um, so hence, maybe if you look at the growth there, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty low. Um, however, there is 
the realization, I think, across government that, you know, provinces and municipalities are at the call phase of service delivery. Hence, you see that at least they grow, they grow at, a, at a healthier growth uh, there. And part of that is really um, because of, you know, some pressures in terms of the uh, provincial government that are being experienced in the education and the health uh, sector. Um, uh, and then in the local government is the provision of basic services, which, um, uh, I mean, the honorable members would appreciate the, the NERSA as coma approval, which was way above um, what was anticipated. And then the fiscals had to respond appropriately uh, to ensure that we cushion our municipalities from experiencing those um, uh, high, high uh, uh, tariff increases. Of concern, perhaps to all of us, I think, honorable members, is the, the debt service cost. We still see the debt service cost uh, increasing at an alarming rate. Um, I mean, it's the, the only item that increases more than it is really the local government equitable share, which grows at 9.3%. But if you look at you know, the other items, um, they, they really don't grow more than the debt service cost. It does mean, honorable members, that we do face a challenge going forward where um, we are paying more in terms of service, uh, servicing the debt uh, money that we could be using to improve some of our services um, uh, to our co communities. If we look at the bottom of this table, honorable members, you will see that there is, we start to look um, at, at an improvement really in terms of the share uh, to local government. Um, so that moves uh, from 22-23 from 8.7% uh, to 10.1% over the MTF. Again, honorable members, this is owing to um, the provision of basic services, which has been fully costed and provided for uh, in, in, the, in the budget. The honorable members would be familiar with this slide um, because in this slide, this is where we have, I think we've always uh, seen the division of revenue as a tool that we can use uh, to redistribute uh, uh, funds uh, from the more uh, affluent areas to the poor to the poor areas in our societies. Um, if you look at the metros, for instance, in in the in the in, in the part on the, it's, it's my right, yes, um, you would see that actually the rural municipalities and your small municipalities, uh, uh, the households, they, um, uh, they, they really get um, quite a lot of subsidy compared to those uh, uh, communities uh, in the in, that reside in the metros, and and this is also a realization that we we face a, a peculiar challenge where uh, our poverty is also starting to urbanize now. So we also. In as much as we ensure this, they are distributive, but we have to ensure that the funds follow the function. Uh, hence, you know, in the main uh, uh, formulas, we, we do ensure that where people are residing is where the money is being provided for them. Uh, however, we do add elements of redistribution, which uh, the, the the smaller municipalities then benefit uh, from. Uh, the same goes to provinces, really. Honorable members, um, these, these uh, from here on, I'll be dealing with the, uh, it's the build sources. Uh, there were quite a number of changes that have been introduced uh, in this budget, and they are all really to clarify and also to just add um, where there was lack of clarity. The honorable members would know that usually there is a process um, that uh, government uh, runs um, with the, uh, the, the, the the stakeholders uh, determining the allocation and all that. So some of these things happen outside of the bill uh, itself. Uh, so we have payment schedules uh, that inform the allocations and how they will fall. However, when it comes to the local government equitable share, the dates are actually specified in the bill itself. Um, and, and there were some changes recently where, where municipalities have really failed um, to whether adopt a funded budget or 
they, they, there's some need for, for, for national to then uh, stop those allocations. You know, there's always ambiguity when it came to the, the specified three um, uh, schedules that you know um, uh, are specified. So now in this bill, we, we are starting to recognize that there is the process of, of stopping uh, the LGS, uh, which then requires that you know provision be made for those funds to be relieved. At a, at a later stage, uh, which is different from the three dates that are currently um, uh, indicated uh, in the in the bill. And then the other change uh, is with relates uh, relates to the pledging of the provincial grants. Um, the honourable members uh, would remember that we came in the amendment bill to say. This is a decision that has been taken by government uh, to allow provinces to pledge uh, their grants. Um, and, and now we're just introducing it uh, much more formally in the main budget now. Um, I just have to <laughs> indicate maybe that there hasn't been any applications for this yet, um, but we do hope that uh, provinces will, will, will utilize this provision uh, from, from here on uh, because it, it really would assist um, in, in getting the private sector resources and um, uh, I think expertise in, in helping us, especially in the infrastructure space. Um, the section 13 changes to section 13 honorable members. I think here they, this, there's always been the intention uh, and, and there's always been that the drafts are sent uh, to all the relevant uh, stakeholders. So that's been the, the practice really where the transferring uh, officers, you know, and 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 relate and really and relevant uh, provincial treasuries, you know, uh, would receive this report along with the treasuries, of course. Um, but but when it, they, I think the, the the bill has been silent on the final reports, so we're just specifying now that part that even the final reports must be submitted to all these relevant uh, stakeholders that are involved. The honourable members perhaps maybe would be aware that we have, I think, been experiencing some sort of um, a tendency to transfer money in right in the end of the quarter or in the last month of the financial year uh, for, for various reasons. Uh, of course, the, the, that, that opens the space uh, for, for fiscal dumping as well. Um, so what, what we did here really was to make sure that, you know, the the, the receiving officer, I mean, once the organ of state uh, receives the money, there they has to be a budget um, that, that, that is made. Uh, and and uh, where the, these funds that have been transferred have not been used at the end, rather than those funds being recognized as an expenditure by whoever transferred them, we, we also need a process to then ensure that whoever got the money right at the end um, and, and is able to then account for it. And should it be that those funds are unspent, then those funds then should return to the revenue fund uh, unless the rollover uh, is approved uh, through the rollover process. Uh, this is to ensure really that we, we try to curtail the, 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 the growing phenomenon of fiscal, of fiscal dumping. Um, then uh, again, honourable members, the uh, is the process that has been so. What usually happens, like with regards to the conditional grants, most of our grants do specify that at a particular time there's gonna be an assessment that is made by the transferring officer, and then they would request from the treasurer to say based on poor spending by a particular province or municipality in a particular grant would like to then stop that allocation. And of course, that is usually followed uh, by a reallocations process. Um, but, but what we have uh, witnessed is that there is lack of uniformity by which this is done. And, and also, if it's not managed, it could lend itself, you know, in, in a situation whereby the one, you know, there's, there's, there's the lateness where this all takes place. So in this particular section, we are starting now to then uh, require that the transferring officers, when they make this application, they make them at a particular date. 
um, uh, and then that there's there's an understanding also from the trans the, the the provincial treasuries and the receiving officers around that process. It also helps, especially for local government who have a particular date with which to pass their adjustments uh, budget. That by that time we could try and ensure that you know all the necessary processes that uh, would unfold from the stopping and relocation have have already um, taken taken place. Um, so, so the section 22 really just gives the uh, effect to, to to the provision that I've already spoken about. It's just giving me to, to the issues around the uh, the local government equitable share uh, and and its um, the, the additional uh, uh, provision when there has been a stopping uh, for for whatever the reason is. And then the honourable members would also know that there is section. 31 uh, now that deals with the liabilities for the costs that are involved uh, when the, the principles of cooperative governments have been broken. So we have seen in a number of institutions, government institutions taking uh, each other to, 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 to the courts. And now we just without really uh, exhausting uh, all the provisions that are provided for in terms of chapter four of the Intergovernmental Relations uh, Framework Act. Um, so we just need to now, I think we, we just make it clear that if you are to uh, consider that a uh, judicial uh, uh, route, but you must ensure first that you are able to explain uh, why, what led to the failures to resolve those issues, you know, through uh, the intergovernmental uh, processes. And also that you also give uh, sufficient time to the treasurer, for instance, and the relevant provincial treasurer, including the, the AG of that uh, particular, particular decision. Then the last, the last one of these substantial changes, honourable members, has been in the emergency housing grant. Um, so it ceases to exist as a Schedule Seven uh, grant. Um, so that would be Part A for provinces as well as Part B for um, for municipalities as well. So this this is really because it, it, the, the, that that grant or those two grants uh, ceased to exist, uh, and now the funds. Uh, have been channeled through the budget vote of the Department um, uh, of, hum of Human Settlements. But my colleagues would speak to that at a later stage. Uh, honorable members, Chair, with your permission, I would like to hand over to Manza to take us through the, the provincial allocations. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fakis. Uh, Chairperson, uh, through uh, maybe with your permission, can I? Uh, I have a challenge with the connection. Uh, can I switch off my uh, camera so that uh, I can be able to improve uh, the connection from my side with your permission, please? Sure thing. Okay, thank you very much. So I will be taking you through uh, the provincial uh, allocation and the slide before us uh, uh, just shows us that uh, the transfers uh, that will be flowing from national to, province, uh, to provinces will actually account 97% of the provincial um, uh, receipts, which will be uh, conditional grants and the equitable share. And uh, we uh, can see, uh, even though the percentage are not provided in terms of the table, uh, that um, the increase in terms of uh, the equitable share is uh, about 2.5% uh, uh, percent in 2023-24, and for conditional grant is 4.3%. Uh, uh, and the additional uh, funds that are provided um, uh, on this would actually be to uh, to address the issues of pressure in terms of um, health and education, and also to allocate as well uh, the uh, the funds that would have been approved through the BFI, and um, uh, to repair and uh, uh, rehabilitate some of the infrastructure damages that um, actually occur in terms of uh, the disaster. In terms of the table, you will see a chairperson that the bulk obviously is in the equitable share and um, followed by a conditional grant. And our share as Western Cape, you can see, is a 58.8 billion in terms of equitable share and 14.5 billion in terms of um, uh, the conditional grant. 
Next slide. Okay, this slide uh, just uh, shows us the technical update to the provincial equitable share formula, um, uh, which uh, we can see that um, uh, the, the formula has been updated with the most recent uh, data where, where possible, and uh, that uh, we are also continuing to phase in uh, the health of the changes that uh, came with um, a review of equitable share formula, uh, equitable share in terms of uh, our health component. We are in the second year in terms of implementing the changes in terms of uh, our health um, uh, component, uh, uh, which was actually uh, implemented uh, from 2022 MTF. And uh, the 2024 25 will be the last year in terms of facing in uh, these changes that are coming in terms of uh, the health component. Uh, so, as you can see on the blog on, on your right, that uh, education takes um, uh, 48%, uh, and uh, that um, uh, health takes about 27%. Uh, percent. In terms of education, the data has been um, updated with the recent data uh, using the mid-year population uh, and the school uh, enrollment. So for health, uh, as I have already indicated that we are in the second year in terms of uh, implementing the change in terms of uh, the health component, uh, the data has been updated with um, the mid-year population estimate and um, the, the risk adjusted uh, index has been updated with the population in terms of uh, the number of those that are covered uh, with medical aid and the total uh, fertility rate and the premature uh, mortality for provinces. And also importantly with uh, the data in terms of um, uh, the patient load uh, the, that would have um, uh, that we would have actually uh, received from uh, DHIS. So the basic component uh, also have been updated, um, which takes about 16% have been updated with the media uh, population estimates and the poverty as well uh, component has been updated with the media uh, population estimate for 2022 and um, the income and expenditure survey. Um, uh, that, that we have as latest. And uh, the economic component is actually updated uh, with uh, the GDP uh, figures and uh, data. And uh, the institutional one, uh, but there is no data because it is actually divided across um, uh, the same across all, all provinces. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So the next slide, Chairperson, um, uh, uh, talks uh, to uh, the changes uh, that are there in terms of, of uh, uh, the equitable share. Uh, there is a total uh, amount of uh, about 20 billion that has been allocated over the MTF uh, to the education sector uh, to actually deal with the pressures in terms of uh, your compensation of employees. And this 20 billion has been allocated as follow the first year of the MTF, which is 23-24. Well, uh, uh, there's an amount of 5.7 billion and um, 6.7 billion in the second year, and the outer year will be 7.6 billion. When it comes uh, to the health sector, um, a total amount of uh, 3.5 billion has been allocated over the MTF. Uh, this is actually also to deal with the pressures that the sector is actually currently facing, uh, which is uh, uh, the antiretroviral therapy, uh, the uh, TB bedlock, and the health uh, services, uh, the healthcare service bedlock, and as well as uh, your COE pressure that they might be having, your laboratory services, uh, medicine, and other medical uh, supplies. And in the first year, uh, there's an uh, addition of about 7.5 billion. In the second year, uh, 7.8 billion. And the outer year will be 8.1 billion. Uh, so, honorable members will remember uh, that uh, um, after the tabling of the MTBPS, uh, there was uh, uh, an allocation of, um, of uh, uh, the wage agreement or uh, the wage implementation for the 2023 and uh, 31 billion was actually allocated over the 23 uh, MTF. Uh, this was actually 
to deal with the carry through uh, cost of that uh, 2023 um, uh, wage implementation of three uh, percent and the first year of um, uh, the carry through will be uh, 10.2 billion and the followed by uh, 10.4 billion in the second year and the 10.5 billion in the outer year there is an amount of um, uh, 61 million that, uh, sorry uh, 631 million that has been allocated uh, to uh, KZN uh, to address uh, the issue of uh, areas in terms of, of uh, um, the compensation of uh, uh, is in Duna. So when we go to uh, the BFI project, of, uh, there is an amount of about uh, 1.8 billion that has been um, allocated over the MTF as part of uh, the BFI approved funding. Uh, towards uh, Guha SEZ. This, fund, this funding was uh, actually initially supposed to have flown through the DTIC, uh, but uh, it was then um, agreed uh, that after engagement that it must actually uh, flow through uh, the uh, provincial equitable uh, share formula. And the funds they have been allocated in terms of the years uh, for that, uh, for the first year it is 298 million and uh, 632 million in the second year. And the outer year, it was actually 848 uh, million for, 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 for Kuha. The next slide deals with the changes chairperson in terms of uh, the conditional grants. Next slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, the ch changes in terms of conditional grant, starting with uh, education uh, sector, uh, there is uh, an amount of 1.6 billion that has been added to, to ECD grant. Uh, this is actually to increase um, uh, the number of children accessing the uh, the uh, uh, early childhood uh, subsidy and to provide uh, for pre-registration uh, support uh, and also to pilot the nutrition um, support program um, and the first uh, allocation of, uh, of 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 that in terms of the years uh, the 2023-24 20, there is an amount of about uh, 587 million and um, 985 million in 25. Uh, I think I need to provide clarity in terms of this. My apologies. Uh, this amount, even though it is uh, it has been allocated over the MTF, it will start in uh, 2024-25. Uh, Hence, you see that the amount reflected there is actually uh, starting from the 24-25. Uh, there is also an amount of about uh, 5.1.5 billion uh, that has been been added uh, for a national school nutrition program uh, to make sure that uh, um, learners continue to uh, receive uh, 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 meals at school. And uh, the number that has been in indicated there is to say that uh, we hope that this will help to ensure that uh, the 9 million learners continue to uh, to receive meals and also meet uh, uh, the nutritional uh, requirement. An amount of 1.5 billion also has been allocated um, uh, through the infrastructure uh, grant uh, for Houting uh, uh, schools, education infrastructure grant for uh, for Houting school uh, schools program. Uh, this was uh, actually uh, a BFI funding, and the amount also has been split in terms of the financial year. Uh, the first financial year is about 495 uh, million and 500 and uh, 503 million and 498 uh, million over the MTF. There is an amount of uh, 300 million still on the education sector that has been added to deal with the issues of uh, education infrastru uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, which was actually the carried through cost for the disaster that happened in April. Uh, 2022, and this uh, it was actually for KZN and uh, Eastern Cape. When it comes to the transport uh, sector in terms of the conditional grant, there is an amount of 
uh, 8 billion that has been added uh, through the provincial road maintenance uh, uh, infrastructure uh, to deal with the backlog in terms of, of uh, refurbishment of the uh, provincial uh, uh, roads. And the amount also uh, as reflected, the 1.2 billion in the first year, uh, the 2.3 billion in the second year, and the outer year is the 3.4 uh, 4 billion. Uh, still in the infra in the transport uh, uh, sector, an amount of uh, 3.7 billion has been all uh, allocated also to deal with the issues uh, of um, uh, uh, has been allocated also to uh, the provincial road maintenance uh, grant. And this is actually uh, to to build the modular steel, and I think the members will uh, remember uh, this program of Welesizwe a program that we first presented uh, last year during the MTBPS when we came uh, to uh, to present uh, the Division of uh, Revenue Amendment uh, Bill, and for this uh, the first year uh, the uh, the amount is one billion, the second one the second year is one point three billion, and the outer year is one point four uh, billion. I must actually indicate that this amount was actually allocated as well uh, through the BFI uh, 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 process. There is an amount of three, uh, 307 uh, million also that has been uh, allocated as a carried through cost in as far as the road is concerned uh, to deal with the disaster uh, that um, has happened uh, in uh, April 2022, uh, and this also goes through uh, the provincial uh, road maintenance uh, grant. So when you go to the next slide, Chairperson, uh, uh, on the agriculture uh, sector, still on the changes in terms of conditional grant, an amount of 153 million has been added um, to CASP. And uh, this uh, amount would be uh, going to KZN uh, to assist them in terms of uh, uh, the uh, agri hubs. Uh, this funding also was uh, approved through the BFI uh, process. And the first year, an allocation of uh, 8 million is made available. The second year is uh, 86 million, and the outer year is uh, 58 uh, uh, million. On the health sector, in terms of uh, the changes, um, uh, the, uh, the Limpopo Central uh, Hospital funding has been rescheduled uh, to align it uh, with uh, the cash of law requirements. And uh, the uh, rescheduling of those uh, amounts are actually as sh shown that the first year there will be a reduction of uh, 7.2 million and um, addition of 432 million and 556 million uh, in the in the outer year. Yeah, this is uh, through uh, your indirect uh, grant under the component of a health refacilit health revitalization grant. I think the last slide that um, uh, Dr. Paki spoke about he spoke about uh, uh, the uh, the grant uh, ceasing to exist of Schedule Seven under human settlement. And uh, but this is uh, uh, to say that uh, here that uh, that grant indeed has ceased to uh, to exist, and funds has, have actually been moved to national department to allow flexibility, and time must respond in response in terms of uh, dealing with the issues of um, housing housing emergency. So the last slide. Um, uh, from my side is actually on the on the measles, and I think that um, honourable members would remember uh, that there has been uh, measles uh, uh, measles outbreaks in different uh, uh, provinces, and after the uh, the budget has after the budget was table, um, Department of um, Health approached National Treasury uh, to discuss the funding regarding uh, uh, the measles. And uh, 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 the request that has been uh, actually uh, submitted to Parliament uh, to allow uh, that uh, there should be an amendment in terms of the health conditional grants uh, to allow uh, that the sum of uh, funds should actually be used towards uh, this uh, addressing the issue of uh, the outbreak in terms of um, uh, the measles. So, uh, in this slide, honourable members, what we are saying is that we are bringing it to your attention uh, that uh, uh, National Treasury has actually asked that um, 
uh, that uh, Parliament allows allow them uh, to actually do those uh, those amendment. Uh, the wedding is uh, not necessarily something that. Okay, thank you. Um, I was going to say that the exact wedding uh, to be included in, in, in the grant is still being finalized between uh, the National Treasury and uh, uh, the Department of, uh, of Health. Uh, next slide. Then the next two slides, Chairperson, just shows uh, our budget as Western Cape, uh, how uh, much we are actually expecting is the transfer from uh, from national in terms of conditional grant and equitable share. As I started the presentation, I made reference of the 58.9 billion uh, of the equitable share and uh, the 14.7 billion of uh, the conditional grants. And um, these then shows the breakdown in terms of the sector and the specific conditional grant for agriculture. Uh, there is uh, 187 that we see there, 187 million, and for education, um, is almost two billion, and um, for health, we have uh, 7.1 or 7.2 uh, um, a billion, and uh, human human settlement, uh, we have um, 2.2 billion. And uh, for EPWP, uh, public works, we have uh, 56.4 million. And for sports, arts and culture, we have 255.8 uh, million. And for a transport sector, we have about 2.6 uh, uh, billion. Uh, so uh, also the table shows uh, the two outer years, how much has been allocated and in total as well to say how much uh, over the NTF in total is the province expecting uh, to be transferred from the national government. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. I'll hand over to uh, Yolanda for local government. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson uh, and Honourable Members for the opportunity to make a presentation on uh, local government. Um, I'm also going to request to switch off the camera because of the quality um, of, 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 of projecting um, network. It's not too good from my side. In order. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're going to look, the first slide is going to look into how much has been allocated uh, through the MTF for local government. Uh, if we look into this presentation or this slide, you can see that um, there are increases in the allocation for local government. We are aware of challenges that have been faced uh, through different municipalities across the country. And uh, there is money that has been made available, especially to assist with uh, service delivery challenges that are faced by municipalities. Um, over the MTF, we can see that there's an overall uh, increase uh, in terms of what has been allocated uh, for, for direct allocation. We see an overall, an average increase of 5.9%. And we also see an 8.1% increase for the equitable share. Uh, for 2023-24 financial year, we can actually see in terms of allocations that 163.9 billion has been allocated as direct transfers and the equitable share has been allocated 96.5 billion. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, the equitable share also allocates funding for different components that are covered. Uh, one is free basic services, uh, institutional for administration and for um, 
community services. We can see that there's uh, an allocation that has been made for free basic services for 70.9 billion. And we also have 6.7 that has been allocated for administration and 10 billion that has been allocated for community services. The allocation, you know that throughout the years, it has been made through a formula uh, which has been updated through the stats uh, uh, information that we acquired uh, from the Statistics SA from 2021 uh, GHS. Um, and then as I've indicated that um, there's funding that has been made to allocate for basic services, um, which we've seen across the country that have been having some challenges, but there's an 8.1 billion that has been added to the local government equitable share just to increase the allocation. Um, even though there have been challenges with the fiscus and we've heard from the other presenta uh, presenters, but um, there's more money that has been made available in terms of the equitable share to address uh, the challenges of basic services. Next slide. Um, there are some changes that have been made uh, in the allocations for local government. Um, in terms of the equitable share, we can see that there's an additional amount of 2.5, 2.3 and 3.3 that has been made available to cover for provision of basic services over the MTF. This is just to assist municipalities with uh, challenges that they have been experiencing. And then in with the public transport network grant, there's an 8 million uh, that has been allocated in the next financial year. And then in 2025-26, there's been, there would be also an additional um, 13 million that will be allocated. This is just a reprioritization through the grant to be able to roll out the single integrated ticket system. And then as my colleagues have uh, mentioned or indicated, the municipal emergency housing grant, it has been uh, seized, but the funding, we are going to see it through the vote of uh, the Department of Human Settlement. This is again to assist with flexibility in terms of ro rolling out um, the housing projects or municipalities. And then um, the INEP grant, there are some changes that are going to be implemented starting from 2023-24 financial year. The funding is just to assist or the changes is to assist uh, with the current energies, um, energy to, uh, is to assist with the current uh, ESCOM uh, problems that we, we've been facing, the, the load sheddings and so on. So the fund is going to, to, be, channeled, uh, to be channeled at uh, rolling out the energy technologies such as uh, the solar, the energy saving devices and technologies and all those things. So this is just to assist uh, municipalities uh, during the, the crisis that we are facing uh, with the energy. Next slide, please. Um, and then we have 461 million that has been allocated over the MTF uh, through the public transport network grant. This is a BFI uh, process. Uh, the money would be allocated to city of Cape Town to uh, roll out the My City Public Transport Network uh, project. Um, this fund has been allocated since we've known that in the past the money was reduced uh, for this project, uh, but now uh, 461 has been made available. And then with George, uh, 136 million is going to be reduced 
from their direct regional bulk uh, infrastructure. Uh, this is done because of the revised implementation plans and cash flow from George municipality. But remember, even though the money is being reduced, it doesn't mean that the projects that are going to be funded through this BFI are going to stop. It's just to assist the municipality in terms of uh, rolling out the projects, but the funds will be made available later. And we can see that in the next 24-25 financial year, 1.4 million is going to be allocated to their direct uh, regional bulk infrastructure fund. Uh, next slide, please. Again, uh, the BFI process has made other new allocations for about five municipalities, Etequini, City of Joburg, Solplaki, Drakenstein, and Nelson Mandela. Uh, this money is going to be used to implement different projects within uh, this different uh, specific municipalities. We can see that 88 million has been allocated for Etequini to implement an, an in a project called Avaca Node Program. And then with Johannesburg, they have been allocated 385 for 24, 25 financial year. And going forward, uh, there are some monies that have been allocated to deal with uh, or to roll out the Lufering Mixed Use Development Program. And then with Sol Plaki, again, they are receiving 80. 86 million for the current uh, the 23 24 financial year and going forward in the MTF to to assist the municipality to refurbish and renew the old water supply infrastructure and then with the Drakenstein 305 million has been allocated for 23 24 and going forward to also assist with upgrading of sanitation infrastructure with Nelson Mandela, they have been allocated uh, 380 and 48 million for 2325. Uh, also, uh, going forward through the MTF, they will be receiving more. Uh, they will receiving additional funding uh, to assist them with the water supply crisis within the municipality. So these are the. Uh, allocation over the MTF that have been allocated through different to different municipalities through the BF process. Thank you. Uh, next slide. The next two slides um, reflects. Uh, the Western Cape allocation for each municipality, how much they are receiving over the MTF. Uh, this slide uh, presents uh, the equitable share allocation to different municipalities. As I've indicated that the, the allocation is increasing over the MTF, um, despite the challenges that we are, have, we are facing uh, with the FISCAS, we can see that uh, city of Cape Town as a metro is receiving a, a, a bigger share of the equitable share, and then the rest shares uh, from the allocation that has been allocated of 457 uh, million of, 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 of uh, sorry, 457 billion of the allocation. And then there's the next slide, please. Okay, while we are waiting, the second slide would therefore uh, reflect the allocations to municipalities for, um, can you go to the, the next one? Um, yes, this one, thank you. Um, this uh, slide reflects uh, how much has been allocated through four conditional grants in the 2023 MTEF. We can really see uh, the much increase in terms of 
what has been allocated, especially for infrastructure projects. Um, uh, USDG has been allocated uh, 1 billion and then public transport 1.9 billion. And then for municipal infrastructure, they have been allocated an amount of 459 uh, million. So in total, Western Cape has been allocated 5.9 billion uh, for, 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 for conditional grants uh, to roll out uh, different uh, projects within uh, the province. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. I just want to check if that's the end of the presentation on the 28 slides. Yes, okay. Chair, that's, that's the end of our presentation. Okay. Thanks. Apologies for my coughing. So out of the 28 slides, it's on page 16, 17, 24, and 25, which are the four slides that actually deal with the numbers in the bill. But I'm sure that the members, like myself, has had lots of homework in terms of reading the actual bill, which is much bigger. So I will now take hands on either the bill or the presentation. Ms. Kamish Ahmed, if you can just assist me with whose hands are up, please. Okay. Member Mari. Okay, I only see Member Mari's hand up and then, okay, Member Nkondlo's hand. Those are the only two hands up, so I will take it in that order and then I'll ask mine afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is with regards to the first presentation um, where debt service costs were referenced. I'd like to know um, whether it is projected that the spending on debt service costs will increase. What are the contributing factors and what measures um, can be taken by Treasury to bring down this cost? Thank you. Thank you, Member Nkondlo. Good afternoon, Chairperson, and good afternoon to colleagues. Um, I've got quite a number of questions um, I've got, I'm going to try for this round. Perhaps to start with the um, first uh, presentation of Dr. Bagis, uh, just to, to ask um, about, I think, the comment he makes um, about, um, you know, the, the effects um, that they would consider in terms of provincial allocation formulas, which use, uses your rural versus a metro in terms of allocation, that actually the notion he speaks about of urbanized poverty, is it something to date they've actually started put, pulling into the, the data that helps them to then determine the, um, the, or to revise the actual allocation of the formula. And I'm raising this because I know from here in the province, one of the things, we are one of those provinces that are actually a, a, um, experiencing serious in-migration to the city of Cape Town in particular. So that uh, um, a notion of urbanized poverty, because if you consider who are these people and which areas are they coming from, you actually start to see that in the social cluster, in education, health, all that. So I'm asking that particular question, whether this has actually started affecting the actual formula of allocation in as far as, 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 as that um, uh, realization is concerned. Then my next question is, on the Section 7 changes that are being made or that are being uh, highlighted um, about, the guide, about the pledging of provincial grants, I just want to understand, are there any guidelines you can share with us that what is the process um, uh, from which provinces could actually pledge these provincial grants, um, uh, what kind of conditions and, you know, um, who actually becomes the final uh, arbiter uh, thereof. And I'm asking that also in relation to the Section 18 on the stopping of allocation, if indeed there is any allocation and how do you mediate, you know, that if um, particular municipalities 
are not uh, spending grants and we have to stop them with the process that you have um, outlined that um, the notion of penalizing service delivery or communities that by virtue of the lack of municipalities to spend that money, not because the actual reasoning or the actual service delivery issue um, uh, does not necessarily mean uh, that that uh, particular uh, problem is, is resolved. So how do you, when you decide on stopping the allocation, how do you make the judgment call between that and that particular service delivery issue? So I'll stop there for now, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Member Kondla. I don't see any public online or in the uh, committee here, so there will likely be extra rounds for questions. Member Thank America? Thank you, Chair. Um, Chairperson, a uh, question that I repeatedly ask in um, public accounts committee meeting for the part two departments in terms of the proposed wage settlement at that stage, um, there was uncertainty as to what the final settlement would be and the allocation that was sort of provisionally um, Penciled in was three percent. Now that um, we have more clarity on the final wage offer, which is way above the three percent that is envisaged or anticipated, um, how is Treasury going to respond to that? Um, are they going to uh, make additional allocations to um, provinces to uh, augment the added financial burden that um, national government um, hoisted upon them in terms of their settlement with uh, organized labor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. I'm just going to add one or two from my side and I'll keep my rest for the next round as well. Um, <clears throat> on page 32 of the bill, um, you will see, obviously, the different equitable shares that the respective provinces are receiving. And in terms of that, the Western Cape is getting 58.8 billion, obviously, in terms of the equitable share allocation. When you look at the previous um, three financial MTFs, so what, what does concern me is whenever we get the division of revenue bill, we only see what you're projecting for the future, which ends up always changing anyway. Whereas you don't show people what the previous estimates were that you sent to the respective provinces. So people don't necessarily see the respective baseline cuts where uh, a change in the respective amount actually results in a cut. When you look at the provincial equitable share from just how much we're getting, we are the fifth biggest or fifth smallest, depending on how technical you want to be, in terms of the country getting equitable share. Now, um, I'm reading from my provincial overview book, but this um, relates to national money that we are getting, um, because I, I forgot where my sticky note is now. But in terms of the adjustment to the baseline due to the impact of the new data updates in the provincial equitable share formula, which you have mentioned in the presentation, being phasing from 2023, in the 2022-2023 year, we're essentially losing 368,000. In the 2024-2025 year, we're essentially losing 651,000. In the 2025-2026 year now, in terms of those updates, we are now losing 899,000. And it's not numbers I'm making up, I'm reading from the respective documentation. So in total, the revised um, adjustment to the baseline for the Western Cape government is 1.9 billion rand over the MTF period. Now, I know we always use a lot of technical words in this committee, but that basically means it's a 1.9 billion rand budget cut, which isn't always reflected in this documentation because of how it is written. Then I want to find out, because majority of this money is essentially going to impact the health department, and that relates to the risk-adjusted component, which has seen a change of minus 1.3%. 
The primary health care adjustment in the PES formula is seeing a minus 1.5% change from the 2022 MTF to the 2023 MTF. The hospital component is seeing a 0.6% increase from the 2022 versus 2023 MTF. But we all know, as Business Day reported today, that there's a 7.1% is inflation year on year in March 2023. And it was 7% was inflation in February 2020. And this is separate from the cost of food, the cost of living um, uh, and, and the baseline costs that we see. So I'm very, very concerned about essentially even in health, the minus 1.5 billion rand that we're going to see in the MTF. And in this regard, I would like to know how is provincial treasury, not provincial treasury, how is national treasury going to incorporate criteria in the provincial equitable share formula that will reward good governance. What we are seeing at the moment is the better you do as a province, the more people you help, the less money you will eventually get. And we see this in the updates in the provincial equitable share formula that is determined by national. Despite this, my second question then similarly relates to education. In education, we're seeing a number of grant decreases. Just want to open the book quickly to the respective page as well as the bill to the respective page. In education, essentially we are the fifth biggest or smallest province getting in education infrastructure grant. In terms of this particular grant, we are essentially seeing a minus 4.55 percentage change from the revised estimate of 2022-2023. If you look at this in comparison to the other provinces, the Eastern Cape for this current financial year is now getting 600,000 more than the Western Cape in terms of education infrastructure. And the reason I mentioned that is not because of the 300 that you mentioned for the disaster related, because this is more than that 300. The reason I mentioned this is because, for example, Gauteng and the Western Cape in the adjustment budget of 2022 received money because other provinces such as the Eastern Cape did not spend all of the education infrastructure grant. The Western Cape, on the other hand, spent 100% last year in terms of its education infrastructure money. So essentially, when you look at what other provinces are getting for not spending their money, and when you look at provinces who are spending their money, we as a province, and I see here, um, I could probably, if you take out the separate additional money that Gauteng is getting for the specific program, that we are essentially being punished for doing our jobs well now. And I would like to know what exactly is the National Treasury going to do about this? When I look at the migration, which Member Mukondlu spoke about, and I just want to open the book that speaks about migration. And these are also not my statistics. These statistics comes from the annual school survey from 2018 to 2022. Out of the Western Cape first time learner enrollments from outside the Western Cape during that period, out of the 112,156 new first time learner enrollments in our province in that five year period, 88,465 learners come from the Eastern Cape. Now, I completely agree that the feet will follow good governance, but then the money must follow good governance and the money must follow the feet as well. And I would like to know from National Treasury, what are we going to do about the fact that these learners are coming to our province for education? And similar for what Member Konda mentioned, there are people from different municipalities moving to different urban areas. I think Beaufort West Municipality is actually one of them where people are actually leaving the municipality to other municipalities. What are we going to do to make sure that the money follows the feet so that we can continue giving good governance to more people. Thank you. Mr. Pakis, I'm not sure who will take the first questions. Uh, okay, um, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, honorable members, for that. Uh, I think I will just give the team, so I'll start with the 
uh, provincial team to assist us with the question related to the provincial um, uh, uh, fiscal framework. Uh, and then and then I will come back after Yolanda if she if there are any that aren't uh, covered. So let me start with uh, you, Manda, and, and then Olorato will come in as well. Thanks. OK, thank you, uh, Dr. Pakis. And thank you, honorable members, for very valuable uh, questions. I must actually indicate uh, that uh, uh, the question from Honorable Murray and Honorable Nkondlo, I was actually cut. I only came in when Honorable um, America was actually speaking on the issues of wage. I hope maybe my colleagues would have been able to pick uh, those questions from Honorable uh, Murray and Honorable Nkondlo. So let me start with the one of uh, uh, Mr. Gobian. Sorry for interrupting you. Okay. Member Murray asked about the debt service costs and what okay. measures is National Treasury going to to bring to bring this cost down. Member Kondlo asked about the rural considerations in the provincial equitable share formula. Um, she spoke about immigration, for example, municipality to municipality, for example, maybe if someone's moving from Beaufort West, for example, to Cape Town, for example, how is that included in the PSS formula? I'm just making up municipalities now in terms of just for the example. She also asked about Section 7 in the bill regarding the process for provinces to pledge grants and who becomes final arbiter. And she asked about Section 18 regarding how do you mediate um, punishing residents because municipalities lack of spending. And then obviously Member America spoke about the proposed, proposed wage settlement. And I'm not going to repeat mine because you indicated that you came in at Member America's questions. Thank you. Yes, yes. No, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, for, uh, for those. And um, I think I will go straight to the issues of um, that affects uh, uh, provinces. Um, in relation to what I have uh, actually uh, presented. Okay, the, the first one on, on the wage, as I said, that I'm starting with the wage, uh, is uh, the concern with regard to uh, what is it that we are going to do because uh, now uh, the wage. I think the Minister of Finance, when he was tabling uh, the, the budget, he made it very clear uh, that um, any unfunded uh, wage settlement will definitely uh, um, will result in um, uh, some trade-offs. And uh, the question is to say here that uh, what is National Treasury going to do? Is National Treasury going to uh, provide an additional funding? Uh, I should say that uh, those trade-offs that the minister has actually alluded to, uh, there is an engagement that is taking place between um, uh, National Treasury, uh, DPME, uh, sorry, National Treasury and the presidency as well as DPSA uh, to uh, find measures uh, uh, for us to actually be able to address the 37.4 uh, billion as is actually the cost implication of, um, of, of, of this. So yes, what National Treasury is doing is actually trying to look at the measures to say what are the measures that actually can be implemented because this will have to be funded within the existing uh, baseline. And the details to say whether we will uh, be uh, cutting the province budget that will actually be made available uh, during uh, uh, the MTD, MTBPS. So for now, I think it would be premature to say whether National Treasury will provide uh, additional uh, funding and to what level to, uh, uh, to, to provinces. What I would then appreciate is that, um, yes, we are actually looking at that, met, uh, at that matter and it's actually a concern to all of us to make sure that we come with uh, the amount that is actually required to deal with um, uh, the wage. Honorable Chair, I think you ask uh, very critical questions with regard to the equitable share uh, of formula. And it is indeed true that uh, our province, Western Cape, is actually uh, losing about 1.9 uh, billion uh, over, over the MTF. Uh, and um, 
Uh, I, I would uh, not want to say that we are actually punishing the, the province for, for, for doing good in terms of uh, the good governance that they have exp uh, displayed in, um, in, in, in their provinces. Let me just indicate that the, the, the deadline that you see in there is not necessarily as a result of a budget cut. It was as a result of an update of the equitable share uh, formula, different uh, components that have seen uh, uh, the province losing that amount of money that uh, is actually losing. Uh, for the uh, Department of Education, and uh, um, we had a meeting with um, uh, the Department of Education in the Western Cape uh, about uh, the very same issue of uh, the learner numbers. Uh, the, Learner numbers that we have actually updated in our equitable share has actually shown a deadline in terms of the number of learners in the province. So that is why uh, uh, on the education component, you would have seen uh, that, that, that deadline. However, we have also noted uh, through um, the engagement that we had with, uh, with, with the department that it is actually not uh, the case uh, on the ground because the learner numbers actually are increasing in the, in, the, uh, uh, in, 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 in the province. So that was uh, the first reason why you see the deadline in terms of uh, in terms of that. And in terms of health, and I think my colleagues will be also be able to uh, to add there that in, in, in both health and education, uh, what you must bear in mind, they're the ones that are taking the large portion in terms of uh, the equitable share formula. In terms of uh, health, we have used also the data in terms of the changes that are actually implemented in terms of the provincial equitable share uh, review. We have also considered the data in terms of uh, the, the load that we see in the hospitals and, um, and in the clinics. Uh, so what we have noted for the Western Cape, we have noted that there has been a deadline in terms of the usage of um, of, 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 of those uh, uh, facilities. But we also have noted through different engagements, obviously, with the province that uh, uh, there is a, a strategy that the province is using uh, to make sure that uh, they reach people in their uh, uh, in, in in their houses, and that actually reduces the community coming to the actual facility. Hence, uh, the number uh, has, uh, has 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 gone down. And I think there is also a discussion that um, was actually taking place between uh, public finance uh, and department of health to see how that can actually now be brought into into the equitable share formula but that is not actually the part of equitable share formula the equitable formula takes into consideration the utilization rate of um, of of for those facilities so i think uh, th that is in the main chairperson that makes your equitable share formula your equitable share uh, portion to actually decline uh, the way it has been is the issue of the learner uh, um, enrollment and also the update in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the the health uh, component in terms of the debt uh, cost and the measures uh, uh, and the rural consideration I think that then uh, I will uh, hand over to uh, Olorado in particularly in terms of uh, the the rural consideration, because I know it's part of uh, the equitable share formula review as, um, as, 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 as as we go. And I think Dr. Panis will be able to assist us in terms of the debt uh, service cost. Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Chair. Um, thank you, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Yes, I think in terms of, I think it was the second question that spoke about um, urbanized poverty and the issue of the fact that because of the fact that there's um, the movement of members of the general population into more urban areas, which has an impact on the kind of services that we provide. And, and as Mandla has mentioned, one of the issues that has been on the agenda for the review of the provincial equitable share is discussions regarding how do we incorporate the cost of uh, providing services, um, uh, taking into consideration, I suppose, the rural nature 
um, of different areas within a province. And I think it's something that has been quite challenging to incorporate into the provincial equitable share. Um, and there's been ways that we've had to explore of how do we take into consideration some of those costs. Now, in the changes that have been made, for example, to the health component, and I think it's 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 changes that are progressive in terms of us addressing some of those challenges is, for example, the fact that one of the factors that was taken into consideration when the risk-adjusted index was designed, the one that is currently being phased in um, as part of the review, is that it took into consideration a measure, for example, like sparsity, which takes, which takes into consideration, you know, the the kind of uh, population density or how how far members of the general population are from uh, points of medical services. And what is what is good about that measure is that it is not a measure that is just specifically applicable to um, some of the provinces. It's a measure that is specific uh, that is applicable to all of the provinces. And when the index was designed, it, it actually drilled down to finding a measure for sparsity at district level so that we could take into consideration areas within a province um, where members of the general population actually are quite far from um, facilities that would provide health care, whether it is in a province like the Western Cape or the Eastern Cape. Such a measure then would be applicable um, to, to the 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 risk adjusted index for for each of the provinces obviously then it's not going to be exactly the same measure for all of the provinces but i think what is important is that it is a measure then that is applicable to all of the provinces and it allows us then to have an objective way of taking that uh, cost into consideration and i suppose just the risk adjusted index in general you know is a measure that is applied to members of the general population who don't have medical aid. Another measure, for example, that is taken into consideration is premature mortality. And it is a proxy for looking at like the burden of the level of the burden of disease on the healthcare system. Um, and what we've done, particularly even with this measure, is that we've gone to the extent of looking at the burden of disease even beyond just natural causes of death, knowing that, for example, a province like the Western Cape, there are, um, you know, other other imp sort of like uh, circumstances within the system that have an impact um, on, the, on providing health care to members of, of the general population. Uh, this is something that we're also hoping to see how we can incorporate with the review of the education component, particularly because of the fact that, you know, the data that the the department now has in the lurid system, um, it it is able to uh, track the learners, you know, across the system. Um, and one of the discussions that we're having with, with the sector is, you know, how can we, what kind of measures can we put in place to also differentiate learners, um, you know, according to different categories, take into consideration that, you know, not every single learner is the same. And this is something that every single province um, is facing, which is which is something that is not not easy to do. And those discussions um, are still taking place. Another question that was raised was the, with regard to conditional grant pledging. And I think maybe just, you know, um, just to mention, I think that the question from the honorable member was, with, was that, if there are specific guidelines, and I think we'll just find out details on that and provide a response on whether there's a specific um, guiding document. But at this stage, what is sort of like guiding the, or, or what is the regulatory framework around provincial conditional grant pledging would be the amendments that Dr. Bucky's re uh, referred to specifically within the Division of Revenue Act that provide details um, on the clauses that would um, be applicable if, if provinces do um, decide to go the route of actually uh, utilizing their conditional grants to, to pledge. But obviously, there's specific conditions that must be met um, by, by the provinces. And also, there are also requirements within the, the borrowing powers um, 
within the Provincial Government Act as well, which only allows the MECs of finance to borrow on behalf of the respective provinces, but also then um, the information would have to flow through the Loans Coordinating Committee and the Minister of Finance, and the FFC would also then have to be consulted. Um, the, the other legislation as well that would be applicable to this is the Intergovernment of Fiscal Relations Act, specifically because in the Budget Council, as well as members of the Technical Committee for Finance, would have to be consulted on any matters that are related to um, the, 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 the provinces deciding to borrow. So at this stage, within those uh, three uh, legislative requirements, that's, that's how then the provincial pledging would be regulated but we can also find out from members if there is a document that sort of like details that uh, what i can say is that provinces have been consulted especially then the provincial treasuries as they would be as the MECs of finance um would be the respective departments then that would um actually do the actual borrowing on behalf of the provinces um i think uh, I think the Honourable Chair mentioned changes in the education infrastructure grant as it relates to the allocations for the Western Cape. Um, and I think the Honourable Chair was drawing comparison between, I think it was a revised estimate as well as the new allocation for 22-23. I'm not particularly sure which revised estimate the Honourable Chair was looking at. I think I missed that. But when I draw comparison between what was allocated uh, for the province uh, from the 2022 budget and the current budget, we do actually see an increase in the allocation to the province. But I suppose then we, if if the the committee would want to provide more details on that, and they would want to to know um, details on the changes, we we can provide that. I think maybe if there's also maybe I don't know if there's comparison being drawn between the the 2022. 2023-24 allocations between the two bills. Um, I think what I want to highlight with this particular grant is that um, the two outer years uh, for for the conditional grant, there is always a portion that remains unallocated because there's uh, an incentive that is included within the conditional grant. And before the provinces actually uh, allocated that allocation um, at the beginning of each MTF period, there is a rigorous process of assessing the performance in the grant uh, before before the funds actually then flow to, to the provinces. Um, I think I just want to reiterate what Mantla, Mantla has already mentioned as well about the, the, the provincial electable share. The fact that because the Honourable Chair mentioned that, you know, the bill or Annex to W1 doesn't reflect, you know, the changes in the equitable share as a budget cut. And the reason why we don't do that is because um, the changes in the equitable share really just reflect the the updates that would have happened specifically to the data that informs um, the, the provincial equitable share. Um, I suppose then what what would have a higher impact as well now is that is because we are not only doing technical updates to the formula on an annual basis in terms of the data that informs the formula we are also reviewing changes um i mean incorporating changes resulting from the provincial equitable share review um in terms of measures to be taken uh, one of the things in actual sense how we are incorporating the changes that have been made to the review of the the health component is one of the measures that we often take when we make changes that could have you know a, an impact on the provincial allocations the fact that we are phasing in the changes as opposed to um making the changes all at once is is one of the 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 principles that we apply in the formula as a way of mitigating or, or allowing provinces to adjust to the changes that would happen in the system. So with the health component, we are phasing in the changes over a period of three years, as opposed to just doing it for one financial year. And aside from phasing in the changes that result from the review, the 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 principle that has been built into the formula in general is that once we have actually calculated the formula, there is a phase in as well for the technical updates because we are aware of the fact that um, 
you know, updates to the formula do have a direct impact on on the resulting equitable shares to the provinces. But in 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 updating the formula, there isn't the 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 purpose is not necessarily to add or to reduce allocations. The purpose is to have a measure that is objective that would allow us to um, update the formula in such a way that we objectively um, reflect the need and the demand for services within each of the provinces. Um, I hope we we provided the responses that are sufficient, and um, I think I'll stop there, Honourable Chair. Thank you. Colleagues, I'm going to allow the follow-up questions first before I open up for the new questions. Mrs. Kamish Ahmed, if you can just assist me with if you see hands online. Member Konlo, and then I'll go after, can I see, uh, apologies, Ms. Mpumola, would you like to respond? Um, yes, I think there was a, a question, Chair, uh, regarding the stopping of allocations and uh, from local government. So uh, I wanted to address uh, that question. Um, I just wanted to make the members aware that uh, this process of stopping of allocation when is uh, conducted uh, in the local government space, uh, there are a number of factors that we look into uh, because when the allocation are made at the beginning of the financial year, there are certain things that are submitted to departments that informs uh, what should be allocated to each municipality and the projects that are covered. So the business plan that is submitted to, uh, to the department, it is used to therefore identify projects that are going to be funded for from a specific uh, grant. And that business plan would therefore uh, inform the, the payment schedule on how money is going to be uh, flowing to the municipalities based on the projected uh, cash flow. So on each quarter, uh, municipalities um, would therefore be assessed in terms of their performance, uh, would then look into how they've uh, reported in terms of their Section 71 reports, the reports that we receive from uh, also the, the departments. Um, in those reports, we then write to municipalities to inform them of how much is anticipated to be stopped, and thereafter the municipalities are given an opportunity to respond. Once they have done that, the National Treasury will go through all the responses from municipalities and make a judgment call on whether to stop the money or, or not to stop. But um, what we usually look into is um, what the municipality has um, presented to us. We also look into their section 71 in terms of their reporting. We look into the reports from the department and also we look into the projections that they've provided before the financial year has, has started. Um, the honorable member uh, mentioned that it's as if we penalize, we're penalizing the the municipality or service delivery. But um, I just wanted to make the members to be aware that when we stop funds, that it doesn't mean that projects should stop. It just means that the money is channeled to other municipalities because remember, the stopping goes hand in hand with reallocation. So when we anticipate that there would be underperformance against a specific municipality, we then do the stopping and the money would be challenged, would be channeled to other municipalities. Firstly, if the money is stopped against a Western Cape uh, municipalities, would then look into municipalities that have fast tracked their projects within the Western Cape and then will allocate that money to Western Cape. But if um, there are no takers, then the money would go to another province. This process is also just to safeguard the funding because once the money is not stopped, when the municipal financial year ends, we do another process of uh, recouping any unspent grants. And when we do that, pro that process, the money goes back to the National Revenue Fund. So um, 
when you look into it, it's far much better when you stop the money and then you allocate it as an incentive to those municipalities that are, are, are fast-tracking um, the implementation of their projects. So municipalities are not actually uh, being penalized or service delivery is not being penalized. But how we look at it, we look into the cash flows and the state of readiness of the municipalities. And then for those that are not ready or those that are delaying in terms of implementation, we then channel the, municipal, uh, the funds to the municipalities that are fast spending and then the money will still flow to a specific municipality. Thank you. Mr. Buckies. Um, thanks. Um, my colleagues have had um, our, our responses. I think there are just about two, two things that I think um, are outstanding from our side. Um, and, and, and maybe to add another layer to, to what is currently going on in terms of you would have heard honorable members when we spoke about the BFI and the, the cash flow management between um I think it was it was big is this Mr. Parkish, you're breaking up a little uh, bit. What is happening there? Are those kind of relationships that were Mr. Parkish, if you could just maybe move or which help us manage. Mr. Parkish, can you hear me? The Mr. Buckies, apologies for interrupting you, but are you able to hear me? Colleagues, I just want to check if Mr. Buckies also said very, very bad. Okay, Mr. Buckies, I'm just going to quickly mute you and then I want you to unmute yourself again, please. Mr. Buckies, we have quickly muted you. Can you please unmute yourself again because your line is very, very bad. We're just trying to see if it sounds a bit better now. Mr. Pakis, can you hear us? Um, Mr. Gobian or uh, Ms. Tlawele or Ms. Mapumulo, um, are you able to assist us? Okay, for now, what I'm going to do is, colleagues, I'm going to take the follow-up questions. Um, and then when Mr. Pakis is back um, online with his sound, then we will hand over to him again. Thank you. Member Nkondlo? No, thank you, Chair. I think, Chair, maybe without belaboring these points, I would rather make a I would rather make a, 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 a resolution on this because I think, Chair, one on that question on the on how urbanized uh, poverty or as people are moving, because the people that we are referring to here, majority of them indeed are moving from rural areas and they're coming into the cities. And they, as they come into the cities, they come with their socioeconomic uh, uh, status and realities, which I'm, 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 I'm saying we may not want to bog down this particular um, a division of revenue currently. Maybe we would need to have a conversation outside with National Treasury and our province and maybe take uh, um, our own uh, city to form part uh, of these conversations because I think one of the things we have seen post-COVID is that the realities of particularly these municipalities having to be burdened, particularly those that are in the metros, you know, with the realities of in-migration. And for me, what I'm not finding, Chair, you know, is really um, moving outside of the box or from the traditional public financing to actually start shifting to the realities on the ground. I see us trying to always move within the box of how we would normally finance. And that is why I'm saying maybe we need um, a, a time where uh, maybe we can have more in a workshop or kind of a conversation with National Tre Treasury, our province, and also, you know, maybe we bring in a, in 
the city. Because actually, I think what the colleague was responding to, you know, I was just uh, taken aback with what you were arguing uh, about um, incentivizing good governance. You know, whether that particular argument, you know, because there are always two sides of the coin. Because on one hand, they speak about in the issue of stopping um, uh, allocations where monies have not been spent, you know, because my question is the extent to which that service delivery issue gets to be resolved. And for me, whether a particular municipality, if it is not spending, the money is used to be moved to another municipality within a province or to another province or back to the fiscals. The question I was asking is whether that pertinent service delivery issue, that money was actually had to be diverted, you know, how is it resolved? Now, the argument that you are making on the education front when you make an example of the Eastern Cape from me is that currently as we are sitting, the Western Cape um, had, um, uh, with Gauteng, I think, uh, was uh, received an allocation from money that was not used by the Eastern Cape. Now we come back, as you were arguing, that now, unfortunately, the, the Western Cape education is getting less and money is being given to the Eastern Cape. But the truth of the matter is that once again, we know for a fact, you know, that when it comes to challenges of infrastructure in the Eastern Cape, we recently had cases of kids who actually get to be, um, uh, to die in pit toilets. So for me, once again, this issue that I'm trying to get us to, to hear, how is it being financed? That as you move the money from the Eastern Cape, are you resolving the, the issue of education infrastructure in the Eastern Cape? You are not. You are moving money to the to Gauteng and to the Western Cape who are spending um, uh, their money properly, who've got good governance, but you are not resolving a service delivery issue in the Eastern Cape of education infrastructure that is needed to improve the lives of children in that particular province. So that is why I'm saying, Chair, perhaps we need a separate conversation because it may not necessarily be resolved by the current allocation that we are discussing at this point, because in any way, yes, we'll make inputs, but it doesn't um, a, 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 a change the numbers at this point. And I would also want to support the notion that says, we would want to see the baselines, colleagues, because it makes our work much more better from an oversight point of view when those um, um, uh, projected um, uh, figures are still placed even when, because we know our economy is not growing. So if those baselines can always be placed there so that we, all of us can be able to see the extent to which the projections that were made, you know, in the previous uh, allocations and could not be realized, what exactly is the, is the, is the shortfall? I, would, I, I just wanted to support that issue that you were raising, Chair, that I think it's an important issue as part of our oversight so that we are enabled as the as the legislatures, you know, to start being able from our side to see what is the variation there. Thanks. Thank you. Before I take Member Brankes's question, Member Brankes, is that a follow up mm -hmm. question or a new question? Because I am going to allow around for new questions. I'm just taking follow ups at the moment. Uh, no, Chair. I think it is. It's not a, a follow up. It's a new question. But um, uh, I didn't ask a question in the first uh, instance. So. Mr. Member Brankes, I will take your hand in the second round. I can unfortunately not help if you didn't answer, put up your hand for the first round, but I will take your hand in the second round. We're just quickly dealing with the follow-up questions. Okay, no just problem. Just want to check if there are any other follow-up questions online before I pose mine. Okay, I don't see any other hands for follow-up questions online. So I think it was Ms. Uh, let me just see here quickly. Ms. Lawel Air who spoke about the respective figures that I mentioned. And I want to make an example when I speak about the baseline. So in the Western Cape budgets, and I'm sitting in front of me with the budget book here on page 177, and these numbers are not numbers that the Western Cape created, it's numbers that we get every year. So what we do in our budget is we tell the members of parliament what the auditor 2019-2020, auditor 2020-2021, and order the 2021-2022 figures were. 
Then we tell the members of parliament in our budget what the main appropriation for 2022-2023, which is last year, the adjusted appropriation 2022-2023 for those who are listening from home and not understanding, it's whether your main budget is changing plus or minus, then your revised estimate in the end, what in the end you got with your adjusted amount. Then we include in our budget book your current financial year 2023-2024 amount, which is what National is giving us now. Then we include for members of the public the percentage change from revised estimate from the previous MTF. So what you told us last year you're going to give, and then we look at what you're giving us now, and then we make a percentage calculation in terms of that. Then we also put into the budget book your three MTF financial years, which is obviously 2023, 2024, 2025. So from 2019 until 2025 are the years that we give all of the information in our budget to members of parliament, but also members of the public. When you look at the division of revenue, bill, even the presentation, the only information that is put into this bill, which comes back to that baseline, is you give us the current financial year amount, you give us a 2024 estimated amount, which is what you're telling us now you're going to give us, not the actual amount when we come back to budget committee next year that you might have changed it, and the estimated amount for 2025. So in 2025, we're also going to come back and you may have changed it between now and then, but because you did not put the information in the current budget of 2025, it is considered just we are giving this amount for you. So you're, it, it doesn't show what you were supposed to give us. So let me make an example. Education infrastructure grant, I'm on page 177 of the provincial budget, conditional grants in 2022, okay, Three. From my side, I don't know if it's the same with other colleagues. Uh, Mr. Gobin, can you hear me? Mr. Gobin, are you able to hear me? Colleagues, are the rest of you able to hear me? Yes, Colleagues, are the rest of you able to hear me? Yes, Indeed. We can, yes, we are. We can, yes, okay. Okay. okay, so let me go from 20. So, for example, I'm making education infrastructure as an example now on page 177 of our provincial budget. The main appropriation for last year's financial year, which in technical terms is main appropriation 2022-2023, the Western Cape got $1.23077 billion. Okay. Then the adjusted appropriation, which is the same as the revised estimate, is 1.351539 billion. Okay. Then the current financial year 2023-2024 for the education infrastructure grant is 1.290062 billion. So when you minus the two and you take the difference and you divide it by what we used to get in terms of the revised estimate, you see the percentage change from revised estimate 2022-2023, and I did, did check the number, it is minus 4.55%. So we give the members of the legislature and the members of the public all of that information so that they can see what National promised us and what we're getting now in terms of the different empties. So that was what I was referring to. Then. Just Mr. Gobian mentioned, um, you mentioned that you had a meeting with the Provincial Department of Health. And because we are helping people at their homes, you are now considering it as not part of people visiting hospitals and clinics. And because of that, it does not fall as part of the data of people visiting facilities and that forms part of why we're getting a budget cut. Are you telling me that because we are making it convenient for omas and opas at home, that we are getting a budget cut in health? And then as a follow-up, Mr. Gobian also mentioned uh, the ground learner numbers increasing when you had a meeting with the Provincial Department of Education, that the numbers that we have and the numbers that you have are not correct. And we saw in our previous budget workshop, I think last year with national, this was also a problem in terms of national province data being incorrect. And Ms. Lawele um, said that maybe we can use the Lourdes system data by Western Cape to track the learners. Yeah, but I just quickly I, I'm checked. Using you there. Uh, I... Is this mic on? Colleagues, can you hear me? 
Loud and clear all the time. Thank you. Okay, so all the colleagues can hear me. I'm just going to ask provincial, uh, national treasury if you can maybe just move around a little bit because I can see that the transcription on our side is also transcribing me as we talk. So um, okay, let me just go out and join again. Okay, no problem. If someone from national treasury can just remain on or maybe put your video off in the meantime. I'm going to continue. But I'm, I'm looking here on the provincial will share formula, which we have received previously. Part of that provincial formula, um, just, I just have to get to the page here quickly. Part of that, the education component, which makes up 48% of the provincial equitable share formula, 2022 preliminary data, Laureate school enrollment grade to R to 12 new data. So my understanding is you're supposed to already have the Lurets data. So do you have the Lurets data for the education component or do you not? Because I don't understand what then the meeting with provincial education was that you're saying now that you want the Lurets data. I, I don't get that. If someone can just explain that nicely to me in nice English. Thank you. Um. Thanks, thanks, Honorable uh, Chair. Um, we also joined by Bongani. Um, so I would like that maybe before uh, there are additional um, follow up questions that uh, we allow Bongani uh, to, to come in uh, in some no of these. No problem. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Chair. Bongani, over to you. Okay. Good afternoon, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, and then colleagues. Uh, just to apologize, honorable chair and honorable members, I was briefing the Pumalanga and then I only joined after the briefing from Pumalanga. So I might not be privy to previous discussions, but taking from what I've heard, and I would apologize if maybe I'm not responding appropriately because of that. Uh, the question in terms of the uh, what has been asked about showing of the yes in the bill. Uh, as is done for the uh, provincial uh, documents. Uh, for the division of revenue, the way that is, it is crafted, it is informed by the Intergovernmental Relations Act. And then in terms of section 10 of that act that talks to the division of revenue bill, it says that each year uh, when the annual budget is introduced, the minister must introduce in the National Assembly a division of revenue bill for the financial year to which the bill relates. So that is why when we are showing this, we are showing for the year and only showing the indicative for the outer years. As is, we are even always saying, those are indicative allocations and they are and uh, they are subject to change when we get to the budget of those uh, respective years. So in terms of the Lourdes data, uh, with the meeting with the, uh, department, the Provincial Department of Basic Education, uh, what happened was uh, when uh, the, the data is being collected by provincial departments, however, from the first, uh, I think it's the 30th, of June every year, they are supposed to submit that data to the National Department of Basic Education. And in terms of the number that uh, the provincial departments are submitting to national, they choose any time from the beginning of the uh, school year up until that uh, th until the end of June. So in the case of uh, Western Cape, what had happened was that I, they chose the date, I think it was somewhere around March, but they did indicate that the date that they have chosen uh, like as their snapshot of the learner numbers was before other uh, learners had uh, arrived at the schools and all that. That is why their number is lower. So the, the problem was the kind of the date which the Western Cape has chosen. And it was even agreed there that then the Western Cape in subsequent years, they should look at that and choose a date that is appropriate for them. So because the numbers that were given to national department were even signed off by the HOD of the uh, uh, 
HOD of the Education Department, and we even had le that letter, and it co the numbers corresponded to what was in the in Lawrence. So that's why uh, the numbers, like later on, were said to be lower, is because of the date that was chosen for submission. Not that national or anyone determined those uh, numbers on behalf of the of the Western Cape Department of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members. Uh, I will hear from my colleagues if maybe there are any questions that I should be responding to. And as indicated, I apologize if I'm talking out of context based on a uh, lack of understanding of the proceedings that happened before I joined. Thanks. I might just let's see uh, Ms. Loala. You can go ahead. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. I think I just want to add details to what Bongani has already mentioned. Because the question, I suppose, maybe to provide clarity on what we were saying in terms of the Lurids data. The Lurids data, like Bongani has mentioned, we are using it within the provincial equitable shade to make updates to the formula. Uh, when I was referring to the Lourdes uh, data in terms of the review of the education component, what I was actually mentioning is the fact that the data offers us an opportunity to actually see or explore how we can further review or refine the component to take into consideration uh, some of the issues that the honorable members have raised regarding uh, differences with regard to members of the general population. So in essence, the measures that we've taken in the health component to account for uh, the differences within the members of the general population, uh, part of the review of the education component is looking at how we can further use that data to try and refine the education component uh, where it is possible. In terms of the numbers that have been quoted by the Honorable Chair with regard to the revised estimates as well as then the allocations that would flow to the province for the education infrastructure grant. What could have had to happen because the mem the Honorable Chair does mention the fact that there was a specific amount that was allocated at the beginning of the financial year and the revised estimate is higher and what could have actually happened is that within then the financial year there could have been changes that would have happened to, to the allocations for the provinces and I suppose then that's detail that we can provide but if you actually then draw comparison between what was committed within the bill uh, for for the outer year, as well as changes that would have been made to the provincial allocation resulting from the incentive component being allocated for the 2023-24, when we compare, in essence, the main appropriations, there actually hasn't been a decline within what has been committed in the bill. But I do understand that the revised estimate that the Honorable Chair is providing is different, and it could have resulted from changes happening within the financial year uh, to the allocations that, that flow to the province. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I just want to check who will be dealing with the health question. Mr. Gobin, are you still online? Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I am online, um, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, look, Honorable Chair, um, we are not saying that uh, 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 you are losing because uh, of doing good to the OPAS and the OMAS by taking the things to medication, maybe to their health and every, to their houses. But all we are indicating is that uh, the, uh, the data that we have used did not take into consideration that kind of arrangement that the province would have had. And uh, I, hence I said that uh, there is a discussion uh, between the health uh, and also the study that Chai is doing to see how we can bring that uh, data into uh, into consideration. So I think uh, this is uh, 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 responding to your question to say that uh, 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 then you are losing because you are doing good in terms of the OPAS and the OMAS in terms of uh, taking their medication to them. Thanks. Mr. Gobi and I, I happen to be quite a fast typer. And you just said that you're not saying that you're losing by doing good by helping the OMAS and OPAS at home. Then you said the data we used did not take that into consideration. So what I want to know, just the yes or no, if hypothetically, hypothetically, if the Western Cape Department of Health had to help every single patient in the Western Cape at their house. What would the number for people we are assisting 
be when you put it into the formula? What would that number be? Would it be zero? Would it still be the current amount in the provincial equitable share formula? Would you put the number of people we are helping at home currently into the formula data? Honorable Chair, uh, I think it goes without saying that the number definitely will increase when you take into consideration those uh, those numbers. So what I'm trying to highlight to you is that the, the, the source of data uh, that is used across nine provinces, that then would have been different to that one of Western Cape. Uh, so I think that's what I'm trying to point to you, uh, that uh, that's why uh, uh, there would have been that uh, when you look at the, uh, the utilization or the load that you'd be having, in terms of uh, uh, your uh, your hospitals and, and your clinics, uh, the the facility visits, uh, then it would have been low because of because of that. And uh, obviously, in my view, if you add those numbers, that would have been more. But it should be uh, uh, the, the the common source that all provinces are using in terms of getting that uh, uh, that data. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to open up for the next round of questions because the answer to my question is essentially no. The people we are helping at home are not in the current data of facilities, of hospitals and clinics that are visited. That might have been said in a long English sentence, but the answer is essentially no. Colleagues, I'm opening up for new hands now. Ms. Kamish Ahmed, if you can assist me just with identifying the hands online. Oh, Member Brunkes wanted to ask a question. Any other hands? Okay, I have some extra questions as well. Okay, Member Kondlo, I saw a hand go up and then I saw a hand go down. Okay, so it is a yes for Member Kondlo then. Okay, then Member Brunkes, Member Kondlo, and then I'll go after um, those two members. Thank you so much. Oh, no, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, Chair, am I audible? You are, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, yes to the to the uh, uh, national uh, treasury. Uh, first of all, uh, let me start by saying uh, thank you very much for the presentation. And um, I want I want to uh, 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 um, uh, from the start I want to quote a, a verse from our holy Quran whereby Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us that uh, if we are thankful and grateful to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and God Almighty will always increase for us because of our gratefulness that He affords us. And the verse uh, further reads that if we are ungrateful to what we get, then beware of the punishment of all the of the Almighty. I want to uh, ask uh, National Treasury in terms of the presentation. Um, the conditional grants, which is uh, estimated to about 14 billion, if I'm correct. Um, I want to ask on the, the conditional grants. Does those conditions in the conditional grants, does it speak uh, to inequality? Because if we look at, for example, the Western Cape, the Western Cape is easily, can easily be said that the Western Cape is the the epicenter of inequality in South Africa. And one is that, you know, we look into books, you know, the data that is collected. Now, obviously, the data that is collected, um, members of parliament, they've got their different constituencies throughout the province and um, the departments also, they work on the ground and they come, you know, up with these various uh, data and statistics that we get. Uh, uh, year by year in, in the books of the Western Cape. But when we go onto the ground, when we go into our communities, then these, da this, these data and, and, and statistics, it doesn't speak to what we see on the ground. So let me come back to what I'm asking. The, the, the conditional grants, is there any way in those conditions that, uh, uh, that speaks to uh, inequality that you know, if there's uh, so much inequality uh, in a province or in a municipality, for that matter, that uh, that those grants it must be uh, allocated, you know, to to to, and it must be spent uh, to eradicate inequality. Um, uh, that is my question. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member Konlo.
Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, my question, I think, is on slide uh, 21. And I think on the reforms to the Integrated National Electrification Program grant, um, given what is being said there in bullet number one um, of the changes made into this grant to fund the alternative energy technologies uh, in the rooftop solar power. I've got two questions here. Um, one, I just want to understand whether this means all the new build projects um, of housing, uh, state uh, or uh, grant housing uh, that are given to households by government, are we then saying we are now going to see them uh, being fitted with this uh, rooftop solar power from this 2023 allocation going forward. So it means what would ordinarily in the past be the electrification, you know, um, a program that would fit them with electricity um, uh, into those households is going to be something of the past. I just want to have clarity in simple terms. What does this mean? And secondly, now that um, uh, uh, this is being introduced, is it because National Treasury has satisfied itself that all of these municipalities are actually ready and have got the necessary frameworks in place to roll out this rooftop solar power and uh, all these other energy saving uh, uh, technologies which will be funded from 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 this amount so i'm trying to understand the state of readiness which i would assume national treasury in your funding as i think it was explained that you look at business plans and all of that that can you then say now that you've satisfied yourself and you are actually allocating this funding as part of the reforms it is because you've satisfied yourself that all our municipalities are ready you know, uh, in the rollout of these uh, roofs, uh, roof uh, top solar power, and any other of those uh, uh, technologies. So that is my that's my that's my first question, Chair. Um, I would I would I would I would like to understand at at, at this point. And then, um, okay, let me just stop there for now, uh, 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 Chair. Or oh, the other question I just wanted to to, to check. Perhaps uh, it goes back. I think it's on slide number eleven. Um, and maybe it's also one of those uh, question, questions we may have to take uh, to our 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 maybe follow up discussions. That if we look at this um, uh, PS, you know the allocations there, and I think of one would have asked her even in the workshops that we have held, you know around the um, the percentages. And I'm saying, and if I'm using a, a very pedestrian interpretation, please educate me, colleagues uh, from from Treasury and other colleagues on the platform, is that whilst one and understand the importance, you know, in terms of the percentages, I'm very worried in terms of what would be defined as economic. Perhaps maybe such could be explained further. And I'm raising this because of the current challenge of our growth prospects and the extent to which our allocations actually also contribute into economic um, endowments or economic participation uh, initiatives. And I'm not sure to the extent into the allocation such gets to be defined, you know, as explicit as education, health, basic services, um, and, 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 and others. And that is why I'm just saying, when I look at it as a 1% uh, allocation um, in terms of the formula, one uh, gets to you just use a very literal uh, um, uh, explanation, you know, to one in understanding how do we account also for economic growth uh, element in as far as our allocation is concerned. Perhaps it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a notion that colleagues, if you can answer me or further explain to me uh, so that I'm able to understand it far better, given where we are, you know, in terms of our of our growth prospects 
especially because this poverty we're talking about there, which we consider, you know, its allocation at 3% uh, or its um, percentage at 3% is found particularly in municipalities as we're, at, we're talking about the, the urban, uh, urbanized uh, poverty. If you are able to, to get me on this one, I would appreciate just some kind of an explanation that gets me to understand, you know, in terms of the allocation, how are we um, uh, looking at the issue of economic involvement, economic participation, you know, um, uh, of citizens, you know, in terms of how we allocate our, our equitable share. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Member Nkondla. I do know that at the previous workshop last year, National Treasury did come and unpack the provincial equitable share formula for us. And they did, in fact, send us the Excel sheet as well regarding data. But I think perhaps what might assist us might be to ask National Treasury in a next session of some sort to come and explain how they consider which data goes into the respective percentages. Might that be able to assist us? Thank you, Chair. I think that, that would assist. Thank you. OK, then in the meantime for that, I will also ask the PO just to forward us those all documents for those who might not have them yet or might um, be. Um, I know with archiving of emails, sometimes it's difficult to find them. I just want to check online if there's any members of the public online, because I don't see anyone who has joined us in the chamber. And I just I don't want to miss anyone maybe wanting to ask a question before I pose mine, because I can always pose mine in writing. Okay, I don't see any hands. I don't see any new buttons or faces online, so I'm going to assume there's no members of the public online. Okay, my first question is, and this is something that the Western Cape has continuously included into its daughter documents. We are very concerned with the non-inclusion of data on special needs learners, on gender-based violence, and safety components in the provincial equitable share. Um, by your own admission on slide 11, those are not things that specifically gets included and considered within the formula. Um, this is something I've raised and other members have raised over a number of years. And for example, the reason we get the Learners with Profound Disabilities grant is um, one of the reasons that were told to us last time was that um, because it is not included in the provincial equitable share. But when you look at, for example, the revised estimate um, and those baselines and so on, the Western Cape is essentially seeing a 16.66% cut in its conditional grant of learners with profound intellectual disabilities grant. And that's both in terms of the previous DORA documents, the page 177 of the provincial budget, um, as well as when you look at the grant, and I just want to give the PO the uh, page number of the grant, which was. Oh, what's that? The Cosiniso. Apologies. I'm going to go on to my next question while I. Oh, it's page 46 of the bill, just for the PO for her notes. Um, yes. Then my second question on page 54 of the bill relates to unallocated provisions to provinces for disaster response, as well as unallocated provisions to municipalities for disaster response. Now, when you add this money up the 145 million plus 372 million, you get 517 million rand of unallocated provisions. Now, hypothetically, if you divide that by nine provinces, every province would, for example, get 57 million each. Now, I wanted to know whether there's any consideration because first there was an uh, energy disaster gazetted and then it was taken away. So so in terms of, of, of energy um, uh, response plans of provinces, how is National Treasury going to help us in this regard? Because I know that the conditions of the INEP grant has been updated to allow for a rooftop, but this is a grant that you guys have been giving us for years. So you might be updating the conditions, but this is a, a type of electrification grant that we've been getting as municipalities. So how is National Treasury in this division of revenue budget going to help provinces become load shedding free? If you take that 57 million rand, for example, as a portion that I divided by nine, that thingy, 
and you take it as what would 57 million rand bring you? If I look at the Western Cape Energy Disaster Response at the moment, we've given 1.1 billion rand of our own money in the Western Cape for this response plan. When I looked at that, for example, the alternative energy support for SMMEs that we are allocating, we are giving 56 million rand. So that money could have paid for that. For example, the emergency load sharing packs that we're allocating is going to cost us 60 million rand. So it would have co it would have covered almost the full amount. Um, the green hydrogen development that we're giving 60 million rand, it would have covered almost all of that as well. Then I'm going to make another example. In the ESCOM annual report, we give ESCOM lots of money. And we know that is the national tried to give ESCOM an uh, exemption for its irregular expenditure, which amounted to 67.1 billion rand as of 31 March 2022 in its previous annual report. Now, if you take the Western Cape energy response that over three years of 1.1 of our own money and you divide it by the irregular expenditure that ESCOM had of 67.1 billion rand, it gives you 1.64%. So if we had only that almost 2% as a pro in every province, if every province more or less got 2% of that irregular expenditure that they had, we could have worked on money for us, for us provinces, for our energy response plans to become load shedding free so that people can be free of blackouts. I want to make another example. The full allocation for the provincial equitable share allocation from national for the Western Cape province is 58 Point nine billion. I've rounded up. Now this means actually that if you t if you compare to the irregular expenditure of ESCOM, that whole irregular expenditure could have paid for the whole Western Cape government budget, and we would have had pocket change of approximately ten billion rand. We could have paid for almost ten Western Cape energy response plans. So we could have tenfold made our energy response plans. Now I know a person can't go back in time and get the irregular expenditure necessarily back unless you go to court and you go and prosecute these people in terms of the money that is now lost, whether it's corruption or maladministration or irregular expenditure that people have to pay back. But in terms of this budget of division of revenue, how is national going to help provinces? We cannot go on like this. We need assistance. Provinces are using now their own money in order to fulfill national government mandates and colleagues it's not fair it's really not fair we're doing it for one mandate then you're doing it for a second mandate we need to figure out an answer to this please thank you um, mr pakis i'm not sure who wants to take the first questions um uh thank thanks for that yeah, very tough questions, I must say, uh, from the community. Uh, can, can I request my, my colleagues um, to tackle the, the, I think, uh, there was a question around, I think, uh, from the pro provincial perspective, uh, the issue around the, the inequalities um, that are taken into account in these grants. Um, and then, and then perhaps I can come in and then later on chair and deal with some of the INEP uh, uh, questions that, that that arose. Over to you. Uh, it Manja uh, Bongani Olorato. Who's gonna go first? Uh, thanks, uh, honourable chairperson and uh, honourable chair members. So when addressing the issue of inequality, we do admit that South Africa is one of the most unequal societies. But the way that uh, the division of revenue or the government budget in general is designed is to help the poor. So for example, when uh, in terms of taking specific inequalities into how we allocate uh, the sort of maybe a grant or anything, it means we will need data on the specific inequalities. However, what I want to indicate is if we build a school, like a public school or a hospital, more people that are using those facilities are poor people because the rich normally go for the private medical aids or the private schools and all that. So in, unfortunately, in 
allocating of funding, we need data to be able to inform those allocations. So now if, uh, because even when we are looking at the data from STATSA, for example, when we are even taking the 2016 community survey, they, that survey did not even produce the, uh, like the income data to be used. So the challenge there sometimes is data. And then now when we are coming uh, to the question about the, uh, the, the economic component within the provincial equitable share, the way that we are measuring that is we are only looking at uh, the economic activity uh, within the, the province. So we are looking at the GDP, uh, the regional GDP, and the funding is allocated based on that. And just to indicate, as the Honorable Member has indicated, is only 1% of uh, that uh, funding. And that represents sort of maybe what the, could have been the provincial tax, if I can put it that way. So the ability of the province to sort of tax. So it's just that we are using those. It, it, has, it, no, it is not necessarily uh, related to the economic growth in a sense of saying uh, the economic growth of South Africa maybe now is being like considered to be grow, going to grow at 0 0.1 or whatever the case. So we just take whatever the economic activity in the province is and the funding is uh, allocated based on that. So when it comes to funding for things such as the uh, special uh, learners and all that and not having sort of a funding specific for them. This is because of the policy. So the policy of the national uh, basic education is talking about inclusive education. So now if we have a, a separate component for the learners with special needs, more especially because that was proposed in the equitable share, the argument was now that we are going to be creating like that a separation, whereas the policy is talking about inclusive education. And also over and above that, they indicated that the challenges that are associated with that. Because when you look at children with uh, like uh, special needs, they are not all the same. So now how do we even start to sort of rank their level of uh, need to try and match the funding? To, back to the learners. So those were some of, so this decision was not necessarily a decision that was made by a national treasury alone, but it was a decision that was uh, canvassed widely and the sector department sort of uh, came to that determination to say that us separating uh, the learners would not be viable. And then the other one uh, in terms of unallocated funding. We hear the Honorable Chair what she's uh, saying about the unallocated funding, and maybe if I'm understanding correctly, she's saying that funding is not sufficient. But uh, the, that money is just in case of uh, a disaster happening. Because as, a, as the country, if we are seen to be uh, planning for disasters, it means we are risky, a country, and that also have, has an impact on the investment of the country. So normally if that funding has been depleted during the adjustment budget or like normally you'll find that or even when the budget is being tabled, there is like a funding that is uh, the reserves that are within the budget and they are allocated if that funding is depleted. And given that upfront, we don't even know how much is going to be utilized from that funding if there are any disasters. That's why it's sort of uh, budgeted based, may, uh, given the, the figure that is there, but if there's more needed, then additional funding will be added. Uh, I'm not sure if I have covered all the, uh, the questions, but my other colleagues can also come in if there are any that I, I have missed. Thanks, Honourable Chairperson and Honourable Members. Uh, Mr. Darker, um, or if any one of the other 
uh, colleagues can just assist. I think you missed um, Mongkonlo's question on the frameworks of municipalities regarding the energy and the INEP and the rooftop and the frameworks. I will deal with that in honorable chair. OK, perfect. Thank you so much. Yes, thank, thanks so much. Uh, so so with regards to the, I think of the, the, the INEP grant um, and the state of readiness, of our municipalities. So firstly, these 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 two grants. One is the one that uh, is given to ESCOM. Um, so the state uh, of readiness. The, I mean, I can assure the, the honourable members that I mean already by the time we started these conversations around um, the grid, uh, the pressure on the grid, they already had about um, uh, plans. Uh, if we could. Uh, amend the framework plans for about uh, 2,000 connections. Um, so at that time, so by by now, I'm sure it's it's, it's quite it's, it's quite a lot because we've then since opened that door in terms of the framework. We've also had some preliminary, um, I think, discussions with municipalities to establish their state of readiness. And of course, honourable members, one would appreciate that. I mean, this is a new provision, um, so the state of readiness is quite different from one municipality to the other, but there are municipalities that were already waiting uh, to, 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 to get this kind of um, provision in the framework so that they can start the rollout. Um, uh, but uh, the Department of Energy, um, uh, which what what used to be the Department of Energy uh, is now in the process of working with municipalities and providing support to those municipalities where uh, support is needed so that they can also uh, ramp up this. Um, and and, and we, we, we're hopeful that that's going to get the results. Um, the, the question really also related to whether all new um, uh, uh, housing projects would now be fitted with these uh, rooftop solar powers. Um, I think the, the idea was they, there's quite still a, a lot of, um, I think, backlogs uh, in our communities um, so that any any type of support should start addressing those before we can then start looking at the connections, the poor um, the, the people that would then need to uh, change the connections. So moving from the grid to, to these uh, uh, rooftop solar um, uh, solutions. Um, so that's, it's not going to be standard across. Um, I think each municipality uh, would need to, through its uh, consultation um, uh, processes, establish the, the most needed and relevant um, solution for that particular community. Uh, it suffice to say, you know, there's about 18.3 billion over over uh, the, the MTF allocated to these, uh, to these two grants. Um, but but I think the implementation will really differ here. Yeah. So uh, priority will will be on on the new solution. Uh, but it doesn't stop municipalities if they uh, pick up from the communities to then continue with the old um, uh, with the with the old solution. So this is an alternative, really, or honourable members, um, which which we're hoping that is going to at least alleviate more pressure on, on the grid, because if we continue to uh, install new um, uh, or put more people into the grid that is already under pressure, um, we, we, we're worsening the, 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 the situation. So that, that, that is as far as um, uh, we, we are in terms of that. Um, uh, uh, so ESCOM is also going to be playing a, a, a huge role in terms of also assisting municipalities in that space. Uh, then, Honorable Chair, I mean, to add to what Bongani was saying, all, almost all our grants are, are focused on the poor. Um, uh, so so the, the, the issue of inequality is, is, is quite dealt with from the the grants um, also at a, a local government level, where, for instance, if the if we're building any infrastructure that will benefit non-poor, we then require municipalities to co-fund that uh, that element uh, because our grants are really specifically looking at um, addressing the issues of of inequality uh, in in the system, which is why also this INEP uh, or energy grant. 
um, is, is also targeted at the poor. So when we talk about these roof solar power panels, we were talking about only for the poor households um, and, and, and in, in a situation where the solution is needed for non-poor, then the municipality should be in a position to approach the market and do that because there's going to be um also some i think the city of cape town has shown us you know that they, they, there are many solutions that could be derived from this predicament uh, of, of load shedding uh, where municipalities can now start buying uh from 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 the from the households as well so yeah i think i think one of the members that that's uh we we covered um the questions I can be reminded of um, which questions uh, we haven't covered. But on a on a good note, honourable members, I think the, there's a question around the incentives. I think we we haven't put it here because uh, George Municipality maybe because they just an entrant into the IUDG, um, which is already. They are there because of uh, their um, good performance uh, in terms of the infrastructure rollout, uh, trying to blend, you know, the, the the funding for their infrastructure plans. Um, so from this uh, budget onwards, they are part of uh, a, I think, a select group of municipalities, you know, that would then be getting an incentive. Um, and that incentive is, I think, one of the, things that we're trying to build into the uh, into the grant system where we have more of these incentives so that you know whilst there are penalties you know there should be some carrot and cake you know for those municipalities that show an effort uh, uh, rather than you know always looking after municipalities that are struggling with also rewarding those that are doing well so yeah um a george municipality is one that has made us proud through this uh, budget process uh, thanks, Honourable Chair. Over to you. Thank you. Given that we have a half an hour left, I'm going to allow members to ask follow-up questions and then we will close the session. Members, do you have any follow-up questions? Ms. Kamish Ahmed, if you can just assist me with identifying the hands. Okay, One. Member Nkondlo, any other hands? Okay, I'll go after Member Nkondlo and then we're going to close the session. Thank you. The chair. In in absence of any other follow ups, can I be allowed uh, to just ask? It's not a follow up; it's a new question on page uh, 26 and 27 uh, on the local government conditional grants. Can I be allowed? Yes, you allowed, Member um, Ngondo. Okay. I think me and you are the last in the marathon here for our session <laughs> um, for questions. So we do have a half an hour. Um, I do acknowledge again that there are no members of the public online that I've noticed or that the PO has noticed as well as in the sitting. Um, so in that regard, I'm comfortable for us to then, um, if you have a new question, you can go ahead. Thanks. No, thank, thank you, Chair. One question I would want to have on page 27, um, the informal settlements upgrading uh, partnership grant for municipalities, uh, which uh, I see uh, is there. And um, I would, um, I think I'm just wanting to understand at this point when I look at this grant, um, and uh, its expenditure right up to the 2021-2022 and, and its allocation, because there's a slight increase uh, on it currently, which I think is about 573 from the reported latest, because we don't have the 2022-23 figures there in terms of expenditure. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this chair because I think there has been a lot of issues around informal settlement upgrading um, and, and that has to relate to backlogs that have been there, if we would recall, during the COVID where we needed to de-densify particularly areas like Danun. So the city of Cape Town would have been one municipality that uh, would have, you know, a, a pressure of uh, funding for informal settlement upgrade, uh, both in terms of, um, you know, try to de-densify, but also provide service sites um, uh, so to ensure that, you know, there is a bit of uh, ability for services in those, but also from a, a safety point of view, because part of what we've been seeing, uh, which SEPs would raise very sharply, is the concern, you know, of the informal settlement and 
how they are, uh, um, they are, you know, uh, and how it is difficult for them, you know, especially during these cases of extortions that are increasing. So I'm just worried about, you know, the very slight uh, increase one is seeing in as far as informal settlements uh, upgrade. Perhaps colleagues uh, would be able to to explain why, just from a business plan point of view, I do not, I'm not expecting because they are not the Department of Human Settlements at this point, but just maybe to give a, for me, uh, some clarity, you know, of what is on their table in terms of the requests and the sufficiency of um, this given once again the discussion we're having earlier on, because most of these informal settlements, I would recall that um, in the province, it is one, I think the city of Cape Town, including the province that have seen a very sharp increase of informal settlements in this particular province. And I'm worried when I see, uh, I think, the the very small increase on funding uh, for informal settlement upgrade. The next one, Chair, is that once again, in terms of how um, allocations are done, um, and when one looks at this as baseline, if you look at regional bulk infrastructure grant, you would see that um, from the allocation to what was actually spent, you've got a 53% spend of almost 109 million, I think, with the latest data that is here of 2021. But interestingly, if you look at this uh, allocation of the 2023-2024, and I'm not sure what informs this, that you've got once again a very high um, uh, increase, you know, in terms of allocation from a 109 uh, uh, spending to almost 680, which is more than double. Can you explain to me what would have informed uh, uh, such, particularly because this is one um, a grant uh, spending, which would have um, uh, been seen, you know, to have been uh, spent at almost a uh, half or 53 percent, if you look at this. And this is very interesting because when you look at rural road assets and you look at the similar um, uh, spending performance um, of uh, almost, uh, I think, about um, uh, 6.2 million uh, uh, in terms of 2021-22 figures, and what you see that uh, the allocation of this, you know, sits at our almost 13.2. So can the colleagues uh, just explain to me so that I just understand their uh, allocation decisions, you know, versus a, a baseline of what gets to be spent and, and, and what is it that uh, drives them when they do those kind of allocations uh, where you see, you know, this uh, very serious variation, you know, from the baseline. Thanks, Chair. Thank you so much. Mine is a follow up regarding the money. So I heard regarding the George, um, what was it? The IUDG grant, but that was not the question I asked. The question I asked wasn't regarding municipalities. The question I asked was in this division of revenue bill, B2 of 2023 as introduced by the Minister of Finance nationally. What? line item amounts in this budget is being given to provinces, not to municipalities, to provinces to become load shedding free. Whether we like it or not, electricity does not know boundaries. OK, they might be grids and so on. But in terms of the impact of the load shedding, we are all suffering and provinces need to step up. But we are now using our own money to assist with ending load shedding. So how much money is National Treasury giving provinces in order to assist us in helping ending load shedding? Because on the 9th of February 2023, the president declared a national state of disaster. On the 22nd of February 2023, the Division of Revenue Bill 2023 was introduced by the Minister of Finance. So the Minister of Finance already knew by the 22nd of Feb that there was a national state of disaster. On the 28th of February, the Minister of the Relevant Portfolio, the Gazette of Regulations, 
On the 1st of March, the Inayata Dora briefing. On the 7th of March, the Inayata Dora briefing. On the 8th of March, the Inayata Dora briefing with the NCOP. With the 15th of March, the NCOP also again had a Dora briefing. On the 17th of March, the NA had a Dora briefing. On the 22nd of March, the NCOP had a Dora briefing which dealt with public hearings and SALGA input, which the NA then had a door that passed the bill on the 23rd of March, 2023. The disaster declaration on energy was only withdrawn on the 5th of April. After March, after the NA passed this particular bill, on the 5th of April, 2023, it was withdrawn. So, so I want to know from, from the National Treasury, not only how much money are you giving provinces in terms of this bill for energy, but why did you not bring an amendment to this division of revenue bill in order to give us money for the disaster, which was already passed by the NA in the 23rd of March. So you could not necessarily have known that the disaster would have been removed on the 5th of April. But even if you didn't bring an amendment to this bill, why didn't you at the time of the 22nd of February when the Minister of Finance introduced the bill and you already had more than a week's time knowing that the president declared the disaster on the 9th of February 2023, why did you not then introduce an adjustment budget for this year for specifically the energy disaster at the time? Or did you then know that the energy disaster was always going to be withdrawn? Thank you. Mr. Pakis or Mr. Dark, I'm not sure who's going to go first. Uh, she is honorable chairperson. I will go first and then my colleagues can come after. Thank uh, you. Just to indicate, uh, honorable chairperson, in terms of the budget process, uh, by the time uh, the president uh, delivers the state of the nation address, the budget is almost completed because there are many processes that it has to go through before that and the consultations. So in terms of the, even if we knew on the day that the, uh, the president delivered the state of the nation, it was almost impossible uh, for us or even difficult, let me not say impossible, difficult for us to sort of factor that in. That is just not the one point. The other point, when uh, there is a, like the state of disaster that has been declared, uh, I, we often as National Treasury know that people think the response is money, but money is not, not necessarily always the response because sometimes it's about changing the way of doing things. But if money is required, number one, uh, the first part of co the first like line of defense, we are saying within your available money or the money that is already in the budget, where can we get this money for these uh, responses? That's why normally uh, you will find that even during the year or whenever when there are disasters, we will ask sector departments to reprioritize within their existing baselines. Because the alternative means, as a country now, we have to go out and borrow more. And uh, I think to a larger extent, there has been an agreement that uh, our borrowing is getting out of hand because we are paying more in terms of towards our debt, even I think is the, like is one of the highest uh, spending items. So that, to, so, by declaring of the disaster does not automatically mean my funding should be made available, but it means if funding is needed, which when it's needed, there also should be assessments that are made because we can't just say there is a disaster declared, funding should be available, and we don't even know the quantum of funding that is available. So now normally what happens is that the National Disaster Management Center after receiving applications, now have to go out and verify those amounts. And only after those amounts have been verified is then that they would recommend funding can be made available for ABC. So in terms of the budget, if there was funding that was going to be made available for that 
a declaration of the state of uh, emergency for the electricity. Then it was going to sort of also take the route of the normal disaster uh, sort of uh, situations that we face and then only uh, later on when the funding is needed that it would have been made available. So, uh, Chairperson, uh, I can also hand over to my colleagues to to add, add, but I'm hoping that this sort of uh, clarifies because even when we are doing the adjustment budget, if, if funding was going to be needed, then it would have been included at that point, uh, at that point in time. But when it was announced, there is no necessarily an immediate trigger for funding to be available. Thanks, uh, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members. Mr. Pakis, are you taking the informal settlements question? Um, uh, Yolanda, uh, I'm going to invite Yolanda on our website, okay. but I'll okay. also come and give a bite uh, on, on that one. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, with regards to the municipal um, emergency housing grant, um, um, Okay, Chair, I think you, uh, the, there's a lot shedding there by, by Yolanda. So so perhaps oh, I, should, I should start. Oh, Mr. Pakis, this is why <laughs> you must give provinces money to help end load shedding. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Pakis, please continue. <laughs> Yeah, it's such an inconvenience. Uh, so, so honourable chair, I think there, there's a, there's a, I think there is a on on the two. I think there, there's the Arabic um, uh, as well as the informal settlement upgrading grant. The, the concern that uh, honourable uh, Angondo uh, uh, raised um, in terms of the methodology really that informs our allocations. There, um, there, there seem to be some inconsistency with. Uh, versus the, the, the allocation versus the spending. If I may start with the Arabic one. Um, so so there, uh, honorable members, I mean, the, the, the criteria to allocate those funding is, is obviously something that is uh, quite consultative in nature. Um, uh, and, and also the, the spending does play a part in terms of what then uh, actually becomes the allocation there. However, um, what we're seeing as the large uh, increases, those are the BFI allocations that we've spoken about. Um, and, and it's important to outline that because they, they, they are, although they are part of the normal budget process, but really the the, the agreements um, that are there um, are quite different. So you might be underspending in some areas of the RP grant. Uh, however, you 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 then apply through the BFI and then based on what you intend to achieve and and and, and so forth, then then you would be allocated the funding there. So what you're seeing as the large increases in that grant is because uh, your 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 allocations uh, for for your municipalities in the province is actually being augmented for specific purposes only and those are related to to what the bfi is is helping us achieve there but but we certainly do look at performance when we look at um uh, in terms of the allocations except for our general purpose grants. So our general purpose grants, those are formula driven. So it depends really on your, um, say the, the backlogs uh, and, and other policy uh, directives from government that um, affect the municipality then they would generate. So we, there are no penalties in those particular grants um, uh, uh, and, and municipalities are just expected to 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 really improve the hence we are reviewing the grants all the grants in the system are being uh, reviewed so that we can see how best we can assist the municipalities but also uh, whether these different and uh, allocate, uh, allocation methodologies that we use, whether they are appropriate or, or not. So um, yeah, so there's, there's that uh, avenue that is available uh, as well. And honorable members, so the informal settlement grant, uh, upgrading uh, a grant, is, is, is quite new in the system. And, and, and what we have learned is that new grants tend to 
uh, struggle in the beginning um, and then over the years and then they start, uh, uh, I think once when the, the, the certainty has settled in, then we start seeing improvements in terms of uh, expenditure. Um, so so that, that grant is poorly spending at this moment. So any uh, decreases that you are, you are seeing or poor performance you are seeing, we are you know, attributing it to that first introduction kind of a, a, a dilemma that, that we often uh, experience with new grants. Um, but we continue to work. I think our our program within the CSP and the Treasury is working really hard with the municipalities to try and, and see how they can uh, better uh, manage and, and assist the, 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 the metros in this case. Uh, to 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 fast track spending there, uh, and and our experience has been that it's not just an issue of spending, honourable members. It's it's also um the the I think the communication that has to take place with the informal settlement uh, at dwellers, uh, in in every solution that um, a, a government comes with, because their buy in is quite important for that successful uh, uh, implementation uh, and intervention. Um, so so we do expect that you know going forward there's going to be improvements there and then where there's a need for additional resources that will be looked at uh in terms of what is then available from from the coffers uh, of government uh in in addressing those issues but but for now honorable members i don't think we should be alarmed with what we are seeing there it's a new grant that is struggling um uh but you know it, it doesn't reflect a lack of um, informal settlements to be dealt with, but it's the groundwork that needs to be made available um, and, 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 and ensure that we are actually in a better position to provide solutions that are acceptable to, to, to our communities. Um, so, so that's that's it on those on those two two grants, honorable members. Uh, I'm not sure that there will be any follow-up questions, but back to you, honorable chair. That's it from us. Yeah. Thank you, um, Mr. Pakis. It is 12 minutes before five, so I'm going to close the session and just ask that the members remain. Um, our negotiating mandate session is on Monday at nine o'clock, so I'm going to ask the members if they have any extra information that they need from National Treasury, if we could maybe please submit that by 12 o'clock tomorrow, which is Friday. And that if members want to send an in input on the on the negotiating mandate and the bill, then we please send that in by eight o'clock on Monday because the meeting's at nine o'clock. So the procedural officer will need time just to put the information together. This means that you will have a whole weekend to go sit and consider your your views as representatives on the on the bill specifically. Um First, I just want to check with the colleagues if you're all in order with that. So request for information tomorrow by 12 o'clock and input on the bill 8 o'clock on Monday. And then um, we can deal with the general resolutions like future meetings, for example. We can deal in the negotiating mandate afterwards after we've considered our views on the bill. Everyone happy with that? OK, I'm going to take silence as concurrence. Yes, OK, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, to National Treasury, I want to say thank you for, for being here. And I know sometimes we can be quite robust, but we're not robust just for being robust sake. We are here, we are elected to be here to ask the tough questions. We are here because our constituents expect us to represent them. They expect us to ask how these budgets are in going to impact the everyday lives. Um, as a, I'm the constituency head of Langsburg, and I've heard today that provinces are not going to get money for energy, despite us already having declared a disaster on the 9th of February, and even though it was already uh, only withdrawn on the 5th of April. I heard today that there's, there's special needs students that we're still not going to take into account in the PES formula, that we need a serious review of the PES formula, because when we help OMAs and OPAs at home, um, our provincial data does not get included into that. I heard today about the truth that we are losing 1.9 billion rand over the MTF on our baseline in terms of the PES. And, and I've, I've, I've heard that we really need to, to think about 
what are we going to do to ensure that the money follows the feet, whether it's across a municipality to another municipality or from one province to another? Because it's not about from where you're coming from. It's about provinces being able to give you that quality service delivery that you deserve. And you for din it. You really do deserve it. But in order to do that, unfortunately, needles and beds and linen and buildings, things like that, it costs money. In order to build schools, it costs money. In order to build roads and become load shedding free and to keep communities safe, it costs money, unfortunately. It costs political will and it costs innovation as well. But in South Africa, it costs money. And Member Murray, for example, has indicated, for example, that our debt service costs are spiraling out. And members such as Nkonlo and America have, have asked these questions on the rural considerations within the PES and how we move from urban to metro areas. Member America asked difficult questions on local government and, and how we are considering proposed wage settlements. And I want to thank National Treasury for answering these questions. If we have any follow-ups, we will definitely send them in. Or if members want to clarify things, or, or if they didn't understand the respective question specifically, I just want to say thank you, um, and we will be in touch with you. I also want to say thank you to Mr. Njadu, our provincial delegate from the Western Cape to the NCOP, for being with us. We appreciate it, and we wish you well in the rest of your day and in your weekend, and we will send you our negotiating mandate from the committee as soon as, as our Monday meeting concludes and the PO is able to assist us to put that administration together from the provincial side. Colleagues, are there anything urgent right now that we need to, to deal with in terms of this briefing before I conclude the session? If not, then the meeting is thus herewith adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Well done. Thank you, Chair. Thanks a lot, honorable members. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Bye.